Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Edward Tunstall, coming on for the second time. Edward is the CTO of Motive Space Systems, a company in Pasadena that makes space robots. Eddie, welcome to the pod. Thank you very much, Spencer. It's good, good to be back again. Good to have you back. Thank you. Yeah. So, since we last saw each other, uh, you'd mentioned that you made it into the movie Goodnight Oppie, uh, which I then watched <laughs> and really, really enjoyed. And the whole time I was watching it, I was like, is that Ian yet? Is that Ian yet? Right, yeah. And yeah. finally, I, I saw a bunch of scenes with you in a JPL t-shirt in what looked like Mission Control. Um, I could only That's imagine, yeah. like, diagnosing the robot or running the robot. What was your role yeah, on that? It's, it's interesting. Well, first, firstly, I was, you know, uh, happy to see that they uh, managed to find a few clips <laughs> where I was actually uh, present and, and engaged in some way. So that was nice to see. Um, interestingly, all of those clips that you saw that I happened to show up in were during some interesting moments during the mission. You know, we were either troubleshooting, investigating some sort of anomaly or something like that, um, which was sort of an appropriate place uh, to find me, you know, at least uh, busy at things. I was for that mission and in particular for Mission Control, I was uh, the lead of the mobility and the robotic arm uh, subsystem team. And so for all operations associated with those uh, subsystems, you know, I was involved in some way or another along with the team I was working with. And so so those few clips, you know, were situations where we were looking at uh, or had already looked at images that came back that signified some sort of anomaly. And we were basically as the sort of uh, resident experts, if you will, on how the mobility system in the robotic arm worked. Uh, in operations, uh, we were there to basically offer insight and contribute to actually figuring out what the heck was going on. That's pretty awesome. I mean, it almost sounds like you were in charge of like all of the robot. I guess that's not perception, <laughs> but it's the arm and the wheel based. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so to to a roboticist, that may sound like that. That that's quite a bit of uh, of the system. It's a lot of scope. But there's so much more. There's communications. There's thermal subsystems. There's power subsystems, yeah, and man. all of that. You know, there's uh, a number of antennas. There's um, multiple uh, sets of stereo. Sounds uh, like you're uh, saying communication cameras. again. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's quite a bit to to, to be uh, considered and, and, and looked at in, in, intently, basically. Um, but yeah, so the mobility and the robotic arm subsystem, really what that came down to for operations was, you know, we were the subset of folks who understood how those systems worked, what their limitations were, their capabilities and so forth. You know, if we ended up in a terrain environment that was quite complex for mobility, we were the ones who kind of understood, you know, where you could drive and where you probably shouldn't try, things like <laughs> that. You know, so we were, we were, that was sort of our focus there. And, and certainly when anything happened um, using those subsystems, whether we drove or used a robotic arm uh, on a given day, uh, we were the, some of the first to see the telemetry, the data that came back and the associated images um, and could then, you know, take a look at what actually happened based on that data returned versus what we had sent up prior in terms of command sequences, what it was supposed to do, <laughs> you know, things like that. So, yeah, it was a very interesting role to play. That sounds interesting. Um, I know when something goes wrong on a terrestrial robot, I mean, you know, you have the luxury of walking up to it with a screwdriver and a multimeter and a oscilloscope, whatever. Um, it's, you know, imagine you don't have any of that stuff on Mars and all you've got is the robot. Nothing I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, situation to be in when, you, when something goes wrong. And, you know, it's, you know, millions of miles away and uh, you've got, you know, a glimpse into what its current state is, you know, by virtue of the data. You know, one of the, the challenges with these types of missions is, when you design these sorts of missions, you have to somehow at some point come up with the 
uh, the suite, if you will, of telemetry data that you want to be returned. Right. And if you, and, yeah. And if you really don't um, represent, you know, critical uh, parts of the system and, you know, pieces of information that uh, could be very beneficial versus the routine information, then you're kind of out of luck, <laughs> you know, unless you manage to do some sort of interesting software update. Oh, um, that and that sort of thing. But oh. for the most part, yeah, you got to kind of think ahead in terms of um, what can, what, what do we need to know to know that things are going well? And what do we need to know when something goes wrong? Do you, I'm, I'm guessing the, the constraint that you're up against is bandwidth. So, I mean, Indeed. It, it's, it seems like it would be a trade off between, you know, having that critical information that you spoke about and running out of, not running out, but slowing down the robot operations because you have to transmit more data than you really need. Do you, yeah. sorry, excuse me. Are you ever able to, um, you know, I know in some programs I've run and, and worked with, there's a verbose output and a regular output, and then there's ways to request certain bits of information. Is that mm -hmm. the case with, with like a Mars-based system as well? Or how do you yeah. how do you engineer for that? There, there are equivalences uh, of many varieties. Um, uh, keep in mind that there's groups of people, you know, on, on the ground, on Earth, who are waiting for different types of data to come back uh, for different parts of the system. And so we all do that to, to a certain extent. Um, depending on what's going on at a particular time, um, the science data is the priority. You know, after all, these are science missions. Uh, but certainly, yeah, and certainly we can't um, successfully and reliably uh, collect and return science data all the time when the engineering subsystems may not be working properly or something odd well, is going on. We didn't and, see before, and I would so. think in order to get ahead of an engineering problem that might, you know, incapacitate the robot in a way that could end the science mission, you would need access to certain engineering data all the time, even when the primary That's mission right. is underway. That's exactly right. And so there's sort of the nominal set of uh, engineering data that you might get back. And then there's um, critical data that you need in certain anomalous situations. And so all of that is sort of throttled up and down and across different subsystems as well. Uh, all relative to the science data in, in, in particular. So he has a lot of that going on. So maybe in order to get like science data through, the engineering data would kind of take a back seat till you can transmit that science data and then it would send a bunch of packets or maybe because this was made in the early 2000s, like the buffer I would imagine probably got overrun or wasn't that big. And so you'd probably drop a bunch of packets and then you'd start collecting again and then transmitting again after the science data was transmitted. And yeah, so guessing. some of that goes. Yeah, some of that goes on, and then there's a number of different facets. So, for example, uh, when we were operating that mission, this is the Mars Exploration Rovers mission. Uh, there were uh, several orbiters, other satellites around Mars, uh, from the United States, from the Europe European Space Agency, and so cool. on. Um, and we would use those uh, orbiters as relays for data. Nice. So the rover would actually communicate to those satellites and uh, we would get data relayed to Earth. Uh, so sometimes data would stay on those satellites. That's interesting. While, while we're doing all this throttling and so forth. So and you, you might just, get you shove it there. Areas. That's like your external hard drive. If you will. <laughs> Grab <Yeah>. it back. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's a lot of different dif different things that we would do to manage the flow of data, um, depending on the you know the mission drivers at the moment. Um, but there was certainly, when everything is going well, all, all is nominal, um, you've got your subset of engineering data for all engineering subsystems, as well as the science data that comes back uh, at whatever the, tr the necessary trickle is. Because there's even a broader sort of if optimization problem, if you will, because uh, all of that data uh, comes from those mission assets uh, through the deep space network on Earth. Right, the series of uh, large antennas that are uh, dispersed around the planet um, and into ultimately uh, JPL's telemetry system and mission control system. Um, now, Who owns keep the in deep mind space that network. Oh, I'm sorry. The deep space, no, no problem. Um, deep space network is a series of primarily three large antenna dishes uh, dispersed around the planet. One is in Australia. One is in Southern California. Um, and where's the third one? In Spain, I believe, in, in Spain. 
Cool. Right. And so these with one of these dishes or multiple, you're get you able to to get data back from all the different spacecraft that are out there. That and on a sphere that gives enough. you enough like lines of contact to be able to talk. That's to, the idea. That's interesting. Coverage. Yeah. So coverage. Uh, think about you know space co coverage throughout space relative to Earth. That kind of thing. That's why um, I didn't know and, about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I bring it up because uh, there's also um, an interesting optimization uh, problem, if you will, or at least a, a significantly complex scheduling problem, whereby uh, <laughs> you've got multiple missions, not just that one rover mission that are going on at the same time. And their data all comes through these pathways. Right? So that's the real so, bottleneck. It's not the relay. It's not the even the rover itself. It's the deep space yeah. network that's being used to access every single space mission in that general direction, probably through one ground station. Or multiple, depending on which missions are, you know, they're looking at in okay. terms of uh, the data. But um, invariably, uh, you never, as one mission, hardly ever have a full use of the resources of the deep space network yourself all day or anything like that. It's sort of uh, an interesting scheduling problem that really smart people <laughs> and mission control across multiple missions in, uh, in different parts of NASA are actually uh, doing really good stuff to ensure that each mission gets their data. How does the the resource sharing work on that? Like, would it be like old school mainframe sharing where you just get a chunk of time or is it more multiplexed a lot faster than that, I would maybe imagine? Or how exactly, like approximately, I guess, is that solved? I'm yeah. probably too stupid to understand the full story. <laughs> Well, it's very complex. I can't even claim that I, I, I fully understand it myself. What I do know is that um, it is primarily scheduled and time based, right? A lot, a lot of the critical uh, activities and, and it's, it, it changes from time to time because at certain times, for example, when a, a mission is about to land on a planet, right? And this is a critical moment <laughs> and you've got to reserve, if you will, some portion of the deep space network uh, to be available for that e that event, um, whereas uh, so so that has to be scheduled well in advance, you know, in terms of mission planning and things like that. Uh, and so there's really a an interesting orchestration, if you will, across multiple teams on multiple missions, and the folks who are principally involved in just the deep space network uh, management. Um, so certainly, time is one of the uh, the main things. People are things are spliced in time. Um, but all with respect to different mission schedules and so, you know, different activities and so on. So it's terribly complex. I've never even uh, attempted to try to fully understand. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. I mean, yeah. to me, even the, the politics of getting, you know, a, a Spanish and Australian and, you know, a U.S., you know, ground station coordinated seems challenging. I mean, just. Just politically, I would imagine that's not the easiest thing to do unless NASA just owns all of them. I'm not sure. Yeah, so, so these are primarily NASA assets. Okay. And of course, you've got local staff and a lot of people who have been with NASA for decades or mm -hmm. at those facilities locally. Maybe they even grew up in the local environment, but this has been sort of their job or their career. Okay, uh, so, so you've got that. And, but but yeah, they're all viewed as, uh, as, as, as NASA assets. That makes, so, yeah. that makes it easier. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Easier, not easy. <laughs> That's right. Not easy by any means. So a lot of this seems like, uh, just to kind of zoom out for a moment, like systems engineering. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, talking about your subsystems you're responsible for on uh, Opportunity and Spirit. Uh, if I'm getting the rover names right, I think I am from the mm -hmm. movie. <laughs> That's correct. For yeah. that mission, it's correct. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I, um, you know, thinking about communications protocols, thinking about information handling, thinking about information exchange. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I actually recently um, read some portions of the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook for Work. Oh, good it's, for you. It's a great resource. I, I'm, I, yeah. I mean, I'm grateful to people at NASA for, you know, for putting that in the public domain. And I, I bought a copy, even though it's free on the Internet, right after I started reading it because it's, it's okay. such a useful reference manual. I mean, it's... Yeah. I'm going to be using it again. I mean, it's it's not the, the last time I'm going to open that book. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, well, uh, yeah. So, you know, note that um, or recall, if you if you already knew, uh, that the field of systems engineering effectively uh, grew out of the aerospace industry. I didn't know that. 
Really? Yeah. And it's because it's sort of the these missions are so huge and complex um, that something like a discipline like that was was essential. Uh, and over the years, like such as the handbook that you, you referred to just now, there are as well a bunch of standards that govern a lot of different things. And people over the years have spent careers building those standards. It's, so it's a terribly complex ecosystem of, uh, of things that are um, probably could not be done without aspects of the discipline of systems engineering. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I didn't realize we had the aerospace field to thank for that. Um, mm -hmm. But Aerospace, military, all, all of those the, are large uh, agency type uh, endeavors. That makes a lot of sense because it takes a village to do any of that stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't even imagine the coordination effort that it must have taken for something like the Apollo program, you know, before yeah. CAD existed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you <laughs> kind of simulation. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine now. Yeah. But I mean, I guess without systems engineering, it wouldn't even be possible because you got to get everybody working in the same direction. I mean, exactly. I, I was reading it because of uh, a construction robotics project that, that my firm mm -hmm. was engaged to work on. So nothing to do with space, but yeah. it's still yeah. really, really useful. I mean, in particular, I would say the uh, the template for uh, creating a VNV &V plan was, was one of the things that I called upon. And then there were a bunch of different, you know, just kind of, it was neat because you could look in the table of contents, see what you were trying to accomplish. Somebody else had been down that road and, and explained it yeah. in, in a really concise way with examples. And mm -hmm. uh, I can't recommend it enough to anyone listening. The NASA Systems Engineering Handbook, it's free. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. So. And, and over the years, it's evolved in such a way uh, in many different directions um, to account for lessons learned. Nice. You know, every, every every failure of any sort of NASA mission or any other you know major agencies, big missions, um, typically generate some number of lessons learned. <laughs> and those things feed back into processes that are systems engineering processes, VNV processes, all these different things. Even um, the act of uh, trying to figure out what happened in some sort of mission failure has its processes associated with it as well. That's interesting. I didn't dig into that as much. So what are some of the processes you follow when you're trying to diagnose um, you know, a, a mission failure? Well, if it's sort of a post-mission post type of thing where the mission is no longer existed because of that failure, <laughs> and you're effect effectively dealing with, um, think of, for example, the, uh, uh, the National Transportation Safety Board. Yep. Right. If there's an aircraft uh, or an airliner has a crash of, a, of an airplane, um, this board uh, immediately becomes involved in that post uh, mortem, if you will, uh, analysis and assessment. Um, so the same sort of thing happens with um, with uh, space missions. You've got a board or more or, or multiple boards, if you will, <laughs> involved in uh, coming to the table and basically applying their processes, which are certainly different from, uh, you know, uh, board to board. Um, they all have uh, quite a number of people who are experts and have been around the block in these various areas or different types of mission uh, sets uh, involved in these things. And this is where, interestingly enough, you find a lot of the, um, the guru type engineers who, for lack of a better description available to me in my mind at the moment, Think of like a bunch of MacGyver types. <laughs> I'm, I'm picturing Richard Feynman trying to figure out the shell explosion. Perhaps. Yeah. Richard Feynman might, 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 might be overkill. Yeah. Might be overkill, <laughs> depending on the failure, depending on the mission, depending on the system. Yeah. But uh, certainly people who, who kind of, the, the great troubleshooters, yeah. as you might imagine. Um, but then not just them. You've got to have the people who really sort of drive the process, if you will. Um, those people who uh, are cognizant about, well, what is it that we need? What information do we need uh, to drive this assessment, to drive this analysis of what really happened? Um, the gurus and the MacGyver types uh, may not be the ones you go to for that. Um, they're actually providing input to the, into the process. Um, but there are others who provide the process, you know, and, and no, this is a, something that evolves over time, you know, o over decades as well. Um, and sometimes uh, there are inflection points in how they do things based on whatever the latest uh, unfortunate event was.
I'm guessing you know, the MacGyver types sometimes go off script and come up with stuff that nobody else thought of. That's why they're hired as for that role. But then do the process people, the do the process people mm-hmm. then go and document what the MacGyver types did and just come up with a new procedure based on it? It depends. If, okay. if it's if it's not the you know sometimes those sorts of things um, insights, if you will, can be too low level for to represent in a process. That makes sense. Makes sense. Um, but if it uncovers something, you know, that the processes somehow did not, would not have re- revealed otherwise, then that might be something that feeds back into uh, some sort of tweak to the process. That makes a lot of sense. That's, that's pretty wise. I mean, there's a lot to be said for not over constraining, um, you know, what yeah. people are doing with the process or even a specification or a requirement. Exactly. Especially when you consider that different individuals will execute the process in slightly different ways. And they're going right? to be more effective if you allow them to. Where, that's right. Yeah, that's right. To use all so, yeah, sweet, sweet so, so there's a whole there's a whole community out there of folks who who uh, come to the table when when things like that happen and you know help us get smarter as we move on. Now, when does that make it back into like the systems engineering handbook or something like that? That's a good question. I, I think the the timelines are probably different case by case. Okay. You know, yeah, it probably depends on how much it really impacts the processes and that sort of thing. Uh, and then, you know, because, of course, every time you make a significant change or even an improvement uh, to, to these sorts of uh, processes, you've got lots of review that has to happen. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, um, you know, you need a set of people to look at it and say, hey, is this does this really solve the problem? Or does this really make us uh, better at what we're doing? And um, how can we implement it? That makes can a lot of sense. Can we insert it into the process? Are there new tools that are necessary to help us, um, you know, uh, carry this out as part of the, as a new part of the process? And all this, this goes on. So it takes some time. Um, but I think, you know, it's probably on a case by case basis, how long it really takes, depending on what's really going on. That makes perfect sense. Well, it's interesting because everything, like I said before, that I I read in there was so concise and easy to read. And, you know, it was almost, I don't want to say dumbed down because that's not the right word. It it was, it didn't use like overly complicated language and it wasn't, Mm -hmm. it wasn't trying to be academic. It was, it was practical and, and, but it seems like when you do that, it's like that saying, you know, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. It sounds like that's a Mm -hmm. very, it's Mm -hmm. very deliberate that it's like that. And it probably took a lot of review cycles, a lot of dollars, a lot of yeah. time <laughs> to, to get that's it. That's for sure. To get it that, that, that easy that and simple. Of, that's right. That that what you just ended there with is really true. Uh, it, it takes a lot of iterations, you know, to get to the point where you have something in front of you that looks like what you read. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, whoever wrote that. I appreciate you. <laughs> well, no, they, they, they deserve uh, lots of gratitude. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just, I mean, again, I... I, maybe I don't take advantage of, of this enough, but, you know, I mean, this, these are public programs. And I mean, I, I guess, yeah. you know, like our tax dollars pay for this stuff. Like part of the reason, I, I guess, is so that, you know, our industry can reap the benefits. And that seems to be part of tech transfer as well, at least in spirit. Like I said, I've not taken advantage to the extent that I probably should. Mm-hmm. But being able to use that reference manual, at least, I, I really appreciate a little bit more, you know, the yeah. like the public service side of it and like how awesome it is that that's there to, to help you know commercial industry so i was i was really grateful oh yeah and that definitely is you know part of uh the mantra if you will and the charter uh for organizations like nasa that are public uh, and in particular nasa you know with in terms of technology the science results all of these things uh remain wide open um it's, it's sort of the part of their charter uh, to nice. to increase knowledge and so on, um, but even beyond uh, organizations like NASA, of course, you've got uh, uh, professional organizations that have um, some sort of um, uh, footprint in these types of things. Things like you know, IEEE has a number of standards that everyone really follows and uses, and the the documentation, at least for them, if not the standards themselves, uh, can be very open and, and available to, to people who need to uh, access some information about them. And everyone I've met that seems to be active in IEEE is is pretty smart and interested in advancing the knowledge I've noticed. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen anyone that uses an IEEE email address who is an idiot or just closed <laughs> off to, to, you know, helping other people out with 
engineer. It wasn't a total nerd that wanted to talk to you about everything they were doing. Right. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. you know, IEEE is, and, and other, some other professional organizations as well, are, are very open in that regard. And they really do a great service that I think kind of goes on, uh, just take, taken for granted quite a bit. You know, AIAA is another, especially in the aerospace industry, um, where you can, and also uh, organizations like uh, INCOSI, the uh, Systems Engineering. Um, you know, they, they have their own, uh, you know, documentation uh, similar to the handbook that you, you looked at. Um, I've been meaning to get into that. Is that, is that publicly yeah. available? Um, it is indeed. So you can find different as different parts of um, their body. Uh, they call them a number of their documents uh, BOKs, Body of Knowledge. Yeah. Um, so the primary high overarching one is the Systems Engineering Body of Knowledge where you can find a lot of this, the, the types of material that you read in the NASA uh, Systems Engineering ha Handbook. And these things over time, you know, they end up uh, cross-referencing one another because, you know, one might cover something in a bit more detail or from a different perspective, um, but still adds to the system engineering uh, body of knowledge. Yeah. You know, um, that's available to the public uh, and, you know, practicing engineers in particular um, to do good jobs. I'll have to give Kosi another goog when I when I get off tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'd mentioned the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook to one of my colleagues, after I, I felt like I'd found you know this religion or so, I was so happy with. Oh it. yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah. I can, I can <laughs> and, that. and he was yeah. like, "Well, you should check out this Kosi one that I use." And I, I tried yes, to find right. it, and for some reason, maybe I just spelled it incorrectly, but in Kosi, I I N C O S. Oh, I N. Okay, I typed just Kosi like an idiot. Okay, in Kosi. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No Appreciate problem. it. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully nobody uh, nobody doesn't hire me because I didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, if they consider hiring you after this moment in time, now they know you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I only know because I was willing to admit that I didn't know. Otherwise, I would have been, you know, continuing to be ignorant on the matter. Well, hey, this this is I found this is how uh, lots of knowledge is, is gained by by admitting that you don't know. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Indeed. I've been told at work a lot that I ask questions that nobody else would ask. So okay. what, what I mean by that is uh, elementary, you know, kind of basic, um, you know, questions that might showcase, you know, that you don't know a thing. But I guess, I don't know, I, 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 I'm just such, I want to know, <laughs> I'm like such a child, yeah, I'm like, yeah. hey, what does that mean? What's that acronym? Can you explain this? And what about that? No, I appreciate the, those types of questions coming from anybody. You know, it's like, uh, as, as they say, uh, you know, um, what, what is it? What's the saying? A question, uh, no, no question is a bad question, basically. Yeah, for sure. Right? And so, yeah, I always appreciate, especially when, uh, you know, someone asks a question that, you know, might fall into that class of elementary or silly questions or, or whatever, however, whatever label you want to put on it. Uh, uh, when that happens and it's something that I was curious about as well, but didn't think to ask, then I really appreciate it. <laughs> well, have you ever been in a meeting and somebody asks a question like that and it becomes very apparent that nobody in the meeting actually knows the answer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I feel like that happens you know, all the time. You have many times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's again, that's, that's, that's another aspect of the value, you yeah. know, that that one person and that one question brought to the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, I think some people are comfortable with that and others, some people embrace that and other people, you know, they, they want to or... be seen. Yeah, exactly. They either yeah. get annoyed because yeah. they, they construe it as a derailment or they mm -hmm. want to be seen to know everything. So they're just, yeah. saying acronyms that they don't know what they stand for or what they mean and parroting it based on context. And I mm -hmm. feel like, I feel like you see that a lot or, you know, another yeah. one is because we work across a bunch of different domains. Yeah. I, I've noticed that, you know, somebody will bring something up that's unique to their domain. So maybe it's an acronym or maybe it's, um, you know, just something that is like elementary within their domain and people there know it. And you ask that question, like, what are you, an idiot? Like, why don't you know, <laughs> you know, so-and-so. Yeah, but then once right. you get past that, they're like, oh, this guy is bringing in some good insights. And you, know, <laughs> you, you can blow past that pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. No, I see all, all, lots of flavors of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Excellent. So what are some of the other, uh, I guess, missions you've worked on over the years? I had no idea you'd worked on Opportunity and Spirit. I mean, I grew up... Mm. 
you know, excited about that. And it was popular science. I, I just remember it was on everything, but mm -hmm. I, I remember mm -hmm. I was, I would have been, you know, 13, 12 years old when that was going on somewhere yeah. in there. Yeah. And so I, I mm -hmm. just huge fan and I, I had a whole conversation with you and I had no idea you were a part of it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, uh, let's see for me, you know, um, well, mainly first I'll say I've only worked on, uh, Rover like missions so far. Um, with one exception, uh, earlier in my career, when I was at JPL, I did some, um, flight software, uh, for one of the earth observing satellites. Okay. Um, that mission was called Topex Poseidon. And it was a mission that, uh, and among other, other things measured the surfaces of the oceans, um, the heights of the oceans and things like that, um, oh, cool. contributing to what we know about um weather and and, and uh the uh oceanographic uh aspects of uh how, how the earth actually operates i'm imagining like a radar uh measurement that was yeah radar was among the uh the suite of instruments but with the other involved. can i ask what the other modalities were uh, oh man i don't actually remember oh, no worries like, <laughs> you think about this this was like uh this had to be late 80s early 90s cool and you know and my, my role in it again was very um was very narrow you know focused on you know a, a portion of the flight software yeah effectively um i i had come to work on the project at a period of time when uh it was a major activity at jpl and um it was kind of a digression, if you will, from what I would normally be doing, um, looking at robotics and so on. You know, all of the rest of my time at JPL prior to the Mars Pathfinder uh, Sojourner rover mission and the uh, Spirit and Opportunity rover's mission, and then to some degree, Curiosity later. Oh, cool. um, you worked on all those? Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's impressive. Curiosity, Curiosity, um, that mission, I was involved more in the um, the earlier design uh, efforts um, that was actually happening happening in parallel to the Mars Exploration Rover's mission operations for Spirit and Opportunity. So you know while that was actually going on, the uh, Curiosity mission was in planning. Uh, cool. Different aspects of it being designed, and so so I was involved uh, to some degree there as well. Um, but prior to all of that. It, this whole domain, at least for in terms of surface rovers and such, was um, was research and development. And you know, nice. I spent my early years at JPL um, involved with others in uh, trying to develop and advance that technology to a point where we could do those missions. Yeah, it makes a lot and of sense. It, yeah, and so you know, when when the, the opportunity came for those things to become real. Um, I got involved to the to varying degrees on the flight mission team. Um, it's easy, not easy, but um, you can have a long career at places like JPL and other NASA centers uh, doing pretty much primarily R&D the whole time and never actually do anything of uh, in a principal way on a flight mission. So for people like me, you know, a robotics researcher, um, we were really focused on trying to enable the technology. Um, and when it came time for those things to be used on a real mission, typically people who, whose career effectively was execution of flight missions would actually be the ones to do that. Oh, that's interesting. So just to take a step back and ask one of my yeah. famous stupid questions, a flight mission is just any mission that flies into space and, and does a thing. Yeah, okay. yeah, forgive well, me. For not no worries, I, I just did. No problem. Well, in some ways, it's kind of a misnomer, for, and, and it's not obvious to people. But yeah, yeah thank, thanks for it, asking that. It's it's something that ha it flies. Okay. Th yeah. Thank you for answering yeah. it. Um, so something that um, has been on a space flight. Got right. It. So it's, it's le left left the Earth, <laughs> yep. and probably in many cases left uh, Earth's orbit as well. Um, and up until and, that, you're basically in a you're considered to be R and D, and you're playing in a sandbox, you know, versus 
flying it into space and, and yeah, yeah. So, so you might not have gotten to the point where um we know how or all across the board to do such a mission yeah that makes right? sense. and you're and you're basically engaged in you know uh trying to develop the various technology components and pieces um so a, a good portion of our effort early on in my early years was focused on that uh, and, you know, doing field trials and stuff like that um, in a manner in which the future missions were envisioned and things like that. And so um, when the technology matured sufficiently and was verified and validated to a significant extent and all of that, uh, realized in hardware that can survive the whatever the space environment or planetary surface environment was basically ready for a real mission uh typically folks who operate and execute flight missions all the time as part of their career um, would actually execute that and that doesn't is indeed what happened except in the case of the sojourner rover for example um the first mars rover from nasa uh in mission control, while for every other spacecraft mission prior to that, that flew by a planet, orbited a planet, and that sort of thing, um, landed on a planet but didn't rove, there were subsystems like uh, I mentioned before, power, thermal, communications, uh, mechanical, and so on. Um, but there was no sort of robotic subsystem that focused on mobility, and robotic arm operations. Nice. Um, now there were op uh, robotic arms on prior landers on the moon. Um, so that might've been the closest that we had come to that in the pa in past missions. But in the modern era, if you will, um, these missions needed people from the research side who developed and understood the technology well enough um, to represent those subsystems in, on a real flight mission and mission control. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So so I, I kind of was one of those people who uh, sort of jumped the fence and got involved in operating mission um, in between missions like that or opportunities for, so, for such missions. I would actually then go back to the laboratory. Nice. Right, and go back to research um, because now I now have a better sense for what really needs to be researched. And, oh, for and sure. Improve. Right. You got a, a different and newer perspective. And so I would go and, and then focus our attention on um, what, what's next. What are new capabilities? Um, there's always new missions uh, that NASA has in its um, queue, if you will, in terms of ambition and new destinations and all sorts of things. And invariably, it's, it's quite rare that um, those systems that can do those missions exist. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And so it's, it's almost always the case that there's some technology development, maturation, R&D that's necessary. And so I would, I enjoyed, you know, jumping back and forth between those two domains. Um, there are others, as I mentioned, who who would only be on one side of the fence or another throughout their career. Um, I, I think I'm, yeah, I'm similarly minded in the, in the way that, I, again, I'm not a space roboticist like you. I, I Hats off and, you know, it's super interesting but anytime i take you know one of the ground-based robots i work on out into the field or i see how people interact with a product i'm working on in, in an actual you know customer use case i learned so much more than i could in the lab or at least I mean not more just different things but it, it refocuses mm -hmm. your efforts in the lab or on yeah. paper you mm -hmm. know when you're you're thinking through you know what you need to actually be working on or yeah. even your concept of operations i mean when you see how people interact with a thing you know, maybe maybe you were all wrong about what it should have yeah. been in the first place. That's right. That's right. No, it's it's very educational, very useful. I remember when we were uh, we were sort of in that transition that I just described. You know, researchers in the lab doing field trials in the desert on occasion, things like that. Um, and uh, we were sort of in that mode still, but we were developing. Uh, the, the flight system, if you will, for Spirit and Opportunity were in development, well on its way. And we had to train 
the large body of uh, scientists who would ultimately operate this mission from the science point perspective on how to do that. So th these missions at that time were relatively new. You know, um, Sojourner Rover was the only thing, only precedent. And you I know, think I might have, when I said the timeline for Spirit and Opportunity, I might have been thinking of Sojourner in my head. Oh, okay. I wonder if yeah, I 1997 was when Sojourner was launched. Okay. Well, and it was only a, about a month mission. Oh, wow. Was, that was much yeah, shorter. It was, what, it was a technology years. experiment, as we say, in, in, the, in the domain. Um, it was something that um, was intended to prove and show that it could be done. Um, and that served its purpose, but then certainly quite not too much long later, that's when Spirit and Opportunity um, were developed with a lot more science capability, a lot more robotics capability, and so on. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this is you know sort of the the way the 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 uh, in the domain works, you know, with sense. different people are doing at different times. Um, but yeah, I, I, as I mentioned, enjoy jumping back and forth, um, technology development, research, uh, and then actual applications on a real mission. That's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. What are some of the individual problems that you're, um, you know, kind of going up against in, in the lab where you're trying, are you just like turning down the temperature, like turning down the, the pressure, are you, trying to see how things would do up against radiation? Um, is it more of like a delay compensation piece where you're trying to figure out how to operate an arm? What is it like an eight or a 12 minute delay to Mars? I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but. No, sorry. So it's between seven and, and, and 20 minutes. You okay. know, sort of round trip. So, Thank you. <laughs> so you never, yeah, you, you almost always wanted to send something that you could then, you know, go get a cup of coffee while it actually executes rather than <laughs> be in the loop, so to speak, because yeah, the delay is just the you know, <laughs> not conducive. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so a, a number of those things are things that one would focus on um, across a number of different types of subsystems, uh, whether it be avionics or electronics or whether it be mechanical mechanisms and so forth. In the robotics area, really, we were almost always focused on the functionality, the capability, right? Um, navigating, you know, some number of meters um, while maintaining position and orientation knowledge within some, you know, some threshold. Nice. Uh, and the, the sub problems associated with that, such as wheel slip and, you know, very natural terrain, um, uh, slopes and roughness and all the different things that can screw you up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Either your knowledge of where you are and, in, 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 you know, in space and time, so to speak. Yeah, I would imagine um, slopes and, and rough obstacles can only make wheel slip worse. <laughs> so. Indeed. Yeah, it is quite worse. You know, yeah. and so, you know, you, you, so, so knowing that you kind of spend a big portion of your time focusing on, well, how can we solve that? You know, one of the ways that um, we went about that was uh, developing and maturing uh, visual odometry technology. Oh, cool. Right. And this was something that became a necessity. Interestingly enough, uh, on, for Spirit and Opportunity, um, that was not, initially viewed as being so important, um, mainly from a risk perspective in terms of, you know, uh, you want to minimize, if you will, the numbers of new technologies yeah, or things sense. that we try for the first time, you know, on certain missions. And when so you, you might want the simplest, the sort of the KISS principle. So to speak. Yeah, exactly. Keep it simple, stupid. But yeah, when yeah. you're talking about so, visual odometry, are you referring to optical mm -hmm. flow or uh, feature recognition and, and tracking or some combination of both? Um, it could be some combination of both, but I'm referring more so to the latter. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. And so this was, um, you know, effectively, and this happened a number of times, so it, it becomes a really useful technology. Uh, so to give you one of the extreme examples, um, we had, uh, for this is for opportunity, we had, uh, and this was shown in, in Good Night Opry, for example, in, in fact, um, we had planned a traverse for the rover that was supposed to be, I believe, if I recall, 92 meters, something like that. It's a very specific number. Is it, is it was it 90? I don't think it was that long. Hold on. Don't, don't quote me on, the, on how long. Oh, it was, no worries. Uh, 
how is anybody going to call that bluff? <laughs> well, hey, I have colleagues who will call me right now. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some number that may or may not be 92 meters. That's right. Traverse. In fact, you know, uh, myself and probably others have written papers with this number in it, too. You know. okay. uh, it's been a while. But in any case, the, 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 the idea is that it was, um, you know, a, a, a traverse was planned, a certain, uh, uh, you know, distance. And, uh, you know, went home, went to sleep, whatever you did, came back. And when data came back down, again, the subsystem, the mobility and robotic arm subsystem that I was um, leading and very involved with, we were some of the first to look for and look at that data to determine principally, um, well, how'd the drive go? You know, did, did, did it drive those, whatever, let's use 92 meters just because, uh, yeah. just to, to stay on um, with the example. Um, did it drive that, that, that prescribed distance or not? And you can see that in telemetry in various ways. Um, so we did see that it uh, looked like it traversed that amount of distance. But then we also looked at the imagery that came down. And the imagery told us that we didn't move hardly anywhere. Is that the imagery from the robot itself or from an overhead satellite? From the robot itself. Okay. And um, we had some other imagery from the robot itself that told us pretty clearly what was happening ah. because we saw the, the wheels actually quite embedded in the soil. I did remember that part of Goodnight Opti. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So effectively, the wheels were turning, you know, I think of encoder counts for yep. the distance that we, you know, but the, the, the vehicle wasn't moving. Brutal. Uh, that much. Yeah. And oh, so and that's visual... where it was stuck at the end because it had dug itself that's into right. a deeper and deeper hole. Exactly. Exactly. So visual odometry is was one of the uh, ways that we dealt with this from that point forward. Um, effectively, so that... wheels are turning. But visual odometry is looking at images and on a, on a periodic basis. And if the features in that image uh, are not uh, being displaced in a way that suggests that, you know, it's actually um, driving that distance uh, and it totally disagrees with the wheel odometry, um, then that, that's one, one way to either stop and, uh, determine what, what was going on, you know, flag a fault or something like that, yeah. or to also calculate the actual distance driven. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that that was the sense. main functionality because in other cases where there was no real anomaly, we're just slipping a lot, Yeah. but we are for the most part getting where we're trying to go. When you're done, uh, driving, you still want to know where you are. Yeah, for sure. And so you can calculate that using the visual odometry of results and not rely on the faulty or misleading encoder data. Yep, makes a lot of sense to me. Now, yeah. I wonder, was, and I wondered this when I, I watched Goodnight Oppie as well, was there an inertial measurement unit anywhere in this equation? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and relied upon very, very much so, especially in nice. the um, determination of the attitude of the vehicle itself, pitch roll and, and so on. Um, as well as the, the calculation of uh, its displacement as it's driving. When you say it's displacement, oh, displaced against where it was. So the trail. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For How some much reason, did I, I was in, thinking in like, like a ship's displacement in water. So like the sinking into the sand is where my head went. But that's uh, well, that, that you get a sense of that too from the um, sort of the, uh, the Z axis, if you will, um, uh, measurement from the IMU. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't rely a bunch on um, on z-axis measurements from inertial sensors per se on the rovers. Um, uh, IMUs, as you might know, can get a little a little flaky. Yeah, well, know, they drift, they and, and drift the longer the you have them running, the more they drift. Because what is it? They're integrating like twice, or is it differentiating? Ah, now I look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but they've essentially got acceleration well, they must, they must and then they're turning into position. They must have acceleration, yeah. Yeah. So so they they're they're basically um uh integrating the uh yeah. the acceleration, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. To get the position and the uh velocity. Yeah, but they're also integrating error and it builds up and that's why you get that stack up and encoder drift or IMU drift, not encoder drift, that's encoder right. slip. Yeah. That's right. So so you've got Encoder drift as an issue that you have to deal with. You've got wheel encoder data that can be, you know, thrown way off if the wheels are slipping. 
uh, or stuck in some way. Um, and you've got the visual odometry, which ultimately becomes a better kind of ground truth measurement uh, with respect to those others. That makes a lot um, of sense because you've yeah. got things you know where they're at that you're looking at. And so that's right. From that you can that's get, you know, as close to an absolute position as you're going to get on that robot. That's right. And if you've got um, all three running and everything is nominal and great, such that they all are basically producing more or less uh, accurate, uh, you know, measurements, uh, then you're basically fusing all that data um, to calculate the best overall estimate. Nice. Yeah. So common filters yeah, thinking, and thinking you know, flavors of all of those, unscented, extended, et cetera, et cetera. Nice. Yeah. yeah I always thought of the... Um... And I guess there's some experiments I, I did when I was in school that, that made me distrust wheel encoders pretty heavily just because of slip. But mm -hmm. I always thought of, um, you know, wheel encoders as like a Coleman filter input to filter IMU data. And mm -hmm. I thought of IMU data as like a better source of truth for position, but still, like you said, drifty. And yeah. so, yeah, I guess if you have something absolute like a GPS or visual odometry or Mm -hmm. you know yeah then you're you're in good shape at that point that's right and and to date we, we still don't quite have the equivalent of gps at mars ah <laughs> <laughs> we've got more and more capable orbiters or satellites um that give you you know that contribute you know to the uh the things like localization on the surface but nothing quite like what we have uh as assets uh that folks on earth can actually rely on what would it take to do that i mean i'm i'm guessing you'd have to launch quite a few satellites and all those yeah. are pretty expensive and well yeah the right the right number of satellites there's been quite a number of proposals throughout nasa and other space agencies and from other countries uh for doing just that um and even cooperating you know um different country spacecraft involved uh to enable that and i think that you know certainly the uh, the prospect for that is increasing as, you know, more and more missions or orbiters get up there. So we might not be very far from it. Um, we just don't have it quite, you know, quite right per se. And, and also today, and also there's um, the degree to which they can actually, the resolution, you know, yeah. uh, where, where is it so, so far or over, you know, you, you knowing that you're within two or five meters of some spot is really not very useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. You know, yeah, so so there's uh, there's more and more work to be done effectively, uh, even if we do tomorrow end up with a GPS capability on Mars. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's kind of like on Earth, you know? I mean, the civilian GPS was, was pretty hampered for the longest time. And yeah. I mean, I think you can get down to centimeter with RTK enhanced GPS now, I think, mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's much, much, much better but, now. And it keeps improving. So yeah, that's, 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 but I mean, there's still impediments. Like if I'm in a city between skyscrapers and I have my phone out and I'm trying to get a GPS lock, I mean, mm -hmm. forget about it. Cause I've got this corridor that's going up and it's trying to look at time from different satellites that ideally are spread out at the widest angle. Cause if they're all concentrated in one place, it doesn't really do its job because the error gets worse. I, I, I tried to explain this to my dags. He's like, my phone just doesn't, isn't telling me where I am. Yeah, and, and, you know, right, Manhattan. Right. And I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> gotcha. Hey, just uh, as a fair, fair warning, my um, my wife just uh, got home and the dogs are probably going to start barking. So, <laughs> Oh, no problem. Do you want to end <laughs> soon or are you just telling me there's going to be some. some no, time? just telling you that um, you're probably going to get some background noise. Oh, no problem at all. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I feel like the trolleys have been pretty quiet tonight here in Pittsburgh, so. That's good. That I was, helps. I was re-listening to our old episode, and I could hear, you know, streetcars going by a few times. And yeah. I think that's a that's just a common collaborative with Spencer Krause feature now. It's to have, that's not bad. That's yeah, not it's, bad. It's charming. It's it. it yeah, you know, exactly. It IDs us geographically. It's either San Francisco or Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, we talked a little bit, and I know this. I almost feel bad asking this. This was like one of the talking points we, we talked about, but I'll, I'll bring it up and you can tell me if you want to get into it because mm -hmm. it was so fascinating to me, but you mentioned it just wasn't really super your area, but we talked a little bit about uh, mining uh, asteroids and mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just sci-fi awesomeness and, you know, would be very yeah. fascinating to yeah. talk about uh, to the extent you want to talk about it. I, is that something? Sure. Well, you know? yeah, I, I can say a few things about it. I mean, sure. I have colleagues, you know, uh, who have started, in fact, that I used to work with at JPL and on Spirit and Opportunity, as a matter of fact, nice. who uh, have gone off and, um, you know, created a startup or two uh, focused primarily on, on uh, mining asteroids and things like that. Um, but I never had gotten into any projects or anything where the, I had the technical focus on that as an objective. Um, and if anything ever came up where I might get involved in something like that, my attention was always on the robotic systems that might be involved. Nice. And what capability do they need to have in order to to facilitate uh, the, those capabilities? And so. You know, there was a period of time when I was working, for example, at um, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, um, and the space department there was um, quite interested in asteroids in general and missions that would um, would land on asteroids and so forth. Even prior to that at JPL, I was involved in a project called uh, the uh, Nanorover uh, Project, Nanorover Technology, and a later project called Nanorover uh, Outpost. Um, these were, I bring these up because these were things where we were looking through the lens of robotics as to how you can even achieve mobility on asteroid surfaces, which have, uh, microgravity at best (laughs) in most most cases. And so, you know, you, you have a wheeled system or a legged vehicle, and if you try to walk at some sort of appreciable pace or roll at some appreciable pace and you hit a bump, then you're suddenly off the ground and, oh. and floating until you come back down, right? Yeah. So, so if you can imagine that as an operating environment, that's wild. I would imagine if the asteroid was small enough, you might not even come back down. You know? Or at least not for a long period of time. Certainly, if you if you uh, if the forces involved have achieved uh, a significant threshold above escape velocity, then yeah, you might not come back. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the, the uh, for some of these asteroids, um, they're very irregularly shaped, and their gravitational fields can be very irregularly shaped as well. That's interesting. So it's not, yeah, it's not like a, and the, the orbit will be like perfectly elliptical about it and things like that. So there's lots of different things to, to think so about. Just just for me thinking about this, if something is shaped, I'm trying to think of like a good okay. So if there's an asteroid that's shaped like. I don't know, like a two liter bottle of Coke, for instance, yeah. and you're on like the bottom of the bottle. Is that going to have a stronger gravitational field than if you're on the side of the bottle or is it the other way around? Um, We've got the most uh, bulk mass is where you're likely to get the most gravitational pull. Okay. However, however, it really kind of also depends on the makeup of the asteroid. Inter- and so in that example, you're probably not going to see much of a difference because the center of mass is still in the center. More or less. Okay. Yeah, but if it's if it's if it's a uh, an iron asteroid, for example, or some major metal. You oh, know, interesting. You can you can you can probably count on a bit more uniformity uh, that that's, that that aligns with your intuition to some degree. Or if the but material it, makeup of the asteroid is heterogeneous for whatever reason, yeah, then you yeah. might see a higher gravitational field where the denser materials are based. That's right. That's right. And we we know that some of those that have been recently investigated up close are effectively like rubble piles nice <laughs> and, and, and different with different consistency across the body so you know I, I think back to one of the recent missions that the um european space agency had done uh and they had a small lander they were visiting the comet and they had a small lander that would release from this the, the actual spacecraft and attempt to land on this comet cometary body and uh, the way they were going to do that was um, to release release it towards the actual body, and at some point, when they were sufficiently close, shoot a harpoon <laughs> into the surface in order to anchor the lander. That's interesting, and I'm assuming that harpoon would have some very interesting properties to be able to anchor into different materials it might come into contact with. Indeed. Now, now the the kicker though is that. The knowledge that 
you know, was generally accessible for this particular comment was not such that you knew the consistency. <laughs> and so, 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 so if it, if it was a rubble pile and you shot the harpoon at it, you would probably disperse quite a lot of it rather than end up actually anchoring yourself. Um, this was one of the significant risks associated with that mission. Um, and it took quite a long time to reach the asteroid on order of years um, for, before they could even find this out. What's the difference uh, between a out comet that, and an asteroid? Just to kind of understand the first principle. Um, so probably most uh, elementary, if you will, um, is that a comet generally has a tail that's, you know, material and other things are protruding off of it. That's as rubble it's coming off. <laughs> yeah, rubble or whatever it is, ice, whatever it is. Uh, and um, asteroids tend to be, tend not to have that, tend to be a more or less uniform or irregularly or non-heterogeneous. Um, okay, so a comet's a harder target. Yeah. Because it's ablating oh, yeah. its, ablating its yeah. own surface, and, and that's what yeah. the tail's made up of. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And there, there have been some stuff, that. yeah, there, there have been some uh, some sample return missions that have gotten close enough to some of these things to, in effect, put a sample collecting device into the the the, the tail, if you will. Oh, cool. Uh, or, or whatever materials are actually streaming uh, off of it, and collect that and bring that back to Earth. That's um, interesting. I would almost think you would have to have like a relatively large sample collecting device for that task, but maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding the design. Yeah, it, it, it depends on, on which objects you were talking about and things like that. For this specific one, um, the sample collecting device was kind of like a, a large tennis racket, if you will. Interesting. And, um, and the think about the spaces in between the, um, the cross weave netting and a tennis racket that had material in it that would um, actually capture some of the really small particles. Oh, so they're not trying to get a large amount. They just want enough to know what's going on. In that case. Were, there, that case. were there different size holes between the cross weaves to go, to go after uh, different types of I materials? Recall. I don't recall it, it being non-uniform, but that's a okay. good question. You have to look back to look that up. No, I'm just I'm just curious. I'm trying to picture it. Yeah. And then with the... So oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, I was about to segue back to your original question. So, so go ahead. If you have thought. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask, would, would the tennis racket be positioned such that the cross weave is, you know, sort of normal to the asteroid's uh, tail? Generally. Yeah. Okay. It's so, yeah, because I, I, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense. That, 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 this way. That, that was the concept. <laughs> <laughs> Best laid plans, am I right? <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, to, to your, your question, um, I bring this back to sort of mining. You know, I, I mentioned all these things because when you're talking about asteroids and such, you're generally bringing all these types of problems, you know, onto your table. And you want to get, find some way to deal with all those problems and then mine it. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, so. <laughs> Well, the first thing you're probably trying to do in certain in certain situations, you you need to somehow anchor, you know, and then do whatever your actual mining operation involves, whether it's drilling or scraping, whatever it is, you know. And of course, you've got to be able to separate from the body at that, you know, after you've got what you need, yep. and find your way back home. Um, so it's a very uh, or at least separate some part of the craft from the body to, to bring back the payload. Well, yeah, yeah. However, however your system architecture works, right? Uh, but invariably, you, you got to find a way to deal with the local environment. <laughs> you know, in order to touch and take away whatever you, you came there for. So it's a it's a very complex endeavor. Yeah. Well it, it also sounds like if, if the asteroid's not homogenous, I mean, you have to figure out where the stuff you're interested in is. So there's like a prospecting mm -hmm. operation right. there as well. I, I'm almost picturing and and you know, again, this is this is me spitballing a problem I don't know a lot about, but I'm, I'm almost picturing a legged robot with anchors that can fan out in the bottoms of the legs. So you mm -hmm. plant that, it plants itself, and then you retract those when you're ready to replant the leg. And But yeah. I mean, that would be a pretty slow form of mobility. I don't know if that would 
get you there in any reasonable amount of time or what the window of opportunity with one of those things is. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that could go wrong with a design like that. So. Well, but, but uh, on the other hand, um, no matter what you do, you're probably going to end up with a, if not a slow system, one that you don't want to move fast. Ah, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> right? Because, yeah, you got, again, any, any sudden movements, you might find yourself. <laughs> Is there a reason why you wouldn't want to hover, like, above the surface until you figure out where you want to mine, and then you just anchor there and do your whole operation, and then, that's you know... that's That's conceivable, and um, some missions have been designed in that way. Um, there was a uh, one of the NASA missions um, called Osiris Rex, for example, uh, visited an asteroid. Um, the actual spacecraft would basically be at a standoff distance from it, um, at least enough so that uh, a robotic arm can reach out and touch and grab and, and that sort of thing. Nice. Uh, the, it's got to be a hard uh, controls problem, especially if you're chasing a moving yeah. thing. But I guess once yeah. you're that far in its gravitational field, you probably have some help, maybe, from the object. I don't know. It's, it's, it's indeed a guidance navigation control problem okay. for the space, for sure. Um, you know, the uh, Japanese space agency also had a mission called Hayabusa that did something similar. They would come close, just as I mentioned, but they had kind of a a, a horn type of a structure from which they would shoot a pellet oh, at, interesting. These, at high velocity, which would make ejecta come up from the asteroid and get captured in this horn and make its way <laughs> into a sample, sample collection uh, capsule That's that was ultimately returned to Earth. That's really cool. So they just had like a BB gun and, you know, a vacuum cleaner, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there, there's a lot of different concepts that people have come up with, some of which, which have actually flown on real missions and, and succeeded or to varying degrees succeeded or, or not. Um, but this is sort <laughs> of the nature of the game. It's like we're yeah. almost always doing something that no one has attempted before or no one has built a system for and so on. You know, So this is what makes, it makes it really exciting for engineers, I think. That's awesome. What I want to know is how valuable are these resources on these asteroids that we're willing to go to these technical and probably expensive lengths to get at them. Because I'm assuming to to run a mission like OSIRIS-REx or uh, like the Japanese one you'd mentioned, mm -hmm. like it, I can't imagine that's cheap, like from yeah. an NRE perspective or, or even like an ops perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like what are we what are we trying to get at? Like what's what's the what are these resources that we're trying to to mine? Yeah, well, first, uh, let me stay, take a step back. Sure. Um, and say that the most of the missions that have actually occurred or have been designed for the to go to asteroids and such have really been science driven. And the, even the sample collection ones, they want to we want to know um, what these materials really are. That makes sense. Because the asteroids are viewed in comets um, as having still to this day some of the primordial primordial materials that have gone into planet formation throughout oh, the that's um, awesome. solar system. And so they're they're part of the the story. And that kind of makes sense. How, yeah, how the, the solar system and the universe evolved to some degree. So from a science perspective, you're just trying to get these small samples, bring them back, and be able to analyze and become more knowledgeable about, about these things. The mining thing is something di uh, even different. It's, it's a similar mission because you're trying, you got to get there, you got to touch it, you got to grab something. Um, but the minerals and such, to your question, you know, yeah. what, what's, what's valuable about those things? So I, I can't claim that I have a good, you know, a strong perspective on that. Um, like the business case, if you will, for, for mining uh, uh, solar system bodies, um, except when it comes to things like rare mater rare uh, materials such as you might find on the moon in the form of like helium-3 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? well, so I guess I don't even fully understand the uses for helium-3. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that there's there's a lot of talk about it. what is What is helium-3 used for? Well, it can be used for a lot of different things, but one of the principal things that's driven a lot of attention uh, on it 
uh, on the moon at least, is that some small amount of it can be used uh, in energy systems to power whole cities and such. Oh, wow. Okay, that's pretty it's cool. A very, yeah, it's a very efficient um, source of energy. Um, and so this is one of the main drivers that uh, different nations on this planet have, you know, have uh, had under their belt in terms of wanting to get at that. Yeah, we've spent but I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, with such a utility, even for just the, the energy um, aspect of it, you can imagine many, many different other applications. Uh, Absolutely. But that's been the principal one, yeah. Okay, so that, that answers the question with Helium-3, and I appreciate you explaining that to me. What are some of the other, uh, I mean, I, I guess things that occur on Earth, you know, is are, there, are we looking for resources that don't even occur on Earth, I'm guessing? Or are we looking for things that do occur on Earth, but just in trace amounts that, you know, if you can bring back, you know, a few kilograms, I mean, that covers the cost of the whole mission or some combination right. of both? So, so I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, no worries. I... And, and, you know, another facet of this, as I'm thinking about your question, is um, uh, in not in all cases of mining solar system bodies is the intent to bring it back to Earth. Oh, interesting. Some of it uh, may be associated with what we're trying to do out there. Um, like, for example, if you think about the moon, just as a, the, the easiest one to think about, it's on the minds of many right now. Um, being able to mine at the moon would benefit uh, future settlements at the moon. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And things like that. So, so you might have local concerns um, as well as things that might actually benefit the Earth. Uh, but yeah, I think that to the extent that I've paid attention to what some of the organizations and, and companies who are focused on mining uh, small bodies, meaning asteroids and comets, um, I haven't gotten to the point of fully appreciating the business case. Yeah, that makes sense. Or the materials or even, you know, um, the trade off between the terribly expensive system that you're going to have to build uh, to even do it. Yeah, for uh, sure. And the ultimate return on investment. But I guess it becomes less expensive if you're already out there. So mm -hmm. if I think of like some future use case where, you know, maybe you're you're just, you know, on a deep space mission, you're near an asteroid and you don't have any, you know, whatever resource you need to complete that mission yeah. or to prolong it, you know, then that seems to make a lot more sense. I mean, it's mm -hmm. cheaper to get a robot, you know, over, you know, a little bit where you don't have to achieve escape velocity and yeah know, right. launch it and all that stuff than it is to do all that okay that, e that ease of ease of access once you yeah. get past the non-ease of getting there <laughs> yeah it's it's expensive shipping yeah <laughs> so, indeed <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I think the local use uh perspective actually that brings it really into perspective for me and and yeah you know this all seems to have more business cases when you look at it that way Absolutely. And, and that's going to be actually essential for the plans that, you know, again, uh, these space agencies across the globe um, are, they have or are developing for the moon. What you are know, the current plans moon. on the moon? I, I don't know if we talked about this last time. I don't, I don't think yeah, we did, though. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. Um, well, they're multifaceted and there's, there's lots of different plans and they keep on developing and evolving. But uh, for NASA, at least, the idea is to uh, develop the ability to have a persistent presence on the lunar surface for periods of time, partly as a way to understand how to do that eventually at Mars. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a lot closer. Yeah, a lot closer. Um, and so plans are all center around how do you get the necessary infrastructure there yep. or how do you go there and build it there. Nice. Right. And this is where some of the mining comes in. You know, there's a whole domain of focus uh, referred to as in situ resource utilization. In situ? How can you use, yeah, in situ, in the present moment, at got the it. present place kind of thing. Because um, if you've got a so, lump of iron ore, but you have no way to refine it, it's, it's just a rock. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
they had not much you can do unless you come up with a way to to deal with that. And even yeah. the essentials like water. Okay, <laughs> more more important. <laughs> like the um, the the NASA uh, you know forthcoming uh, Viper rover mission uh, going to the moon will be going to one of these sort of permanently shadowed uh, crater areas. Uh, it's um, believed that there is uh, water ice and such uh, in the bottoms of these craters and nearby in the permanently shadowed regions. But if it's permanently shadowed, doesn't that mean that it's super duper cold to the point where yes. that's going to be quite frozen, I, I would think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's easy in this domain. <laughs> All problems are hard. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no breaks. No breaks. That's fair. <laughs> so, what? yes, terribly cold. And, you know, the idea is, you know, that it will be prospecting, if you will, moving around, uh, prospecting for ice. Where is the ice? Um, how difficult um, can we discern it will be to get to that ice, if not this mission? you know, than a future one nice. uh, and so on. Um, and so, you know, the whole idea around that is that if the ice and its byproducts are uh, accessible, think accessible in a feasible engineering system sense. Yeah, you know, so we can you actually want the to get to it and use it. Um, then that becomes, that strengthens the basis for um, actually having a human occupied settlement nearby and you have this just like we, if we explore on earth we're often looking for where's the source of water yeah makes you know? sense. and that's all the cities so, are around lakes and oceans and ports exactly exactly uh, but there on the moon you don't necessarily come across you know ready liquid water that you can just boil and stuff like that <laughs> you've got to find a way to uh extract and get access to the ice that may be there so, and process that in some way uh, in order to be able to use it to our to good effect. So we may have talked about this a little bit last time, because I think you'd mentioned uh, an appendage that you worked on for, for such an environment. But what mm -hmm. are the operating temperatures, um, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a place like a permanently shadowed crater on the moon? Yeah, there, it's terribly cold. Um, I recall what we talked about, which was the, um, the uh, cold arm project. Yep we're working on with uh, JPL um, that's intended. And this is just one example of a, one mission trying to go to these types of uh, cold environments um, where the uh, temperatures can get down to like minus 180 degrees. Okay. Celsius. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, you know, usually, and this is not the first time that, you know, missions have been targeted to very cold locations. Uh, and there are engineering solutions to deal with these things, mostly involving heating, heaters of some variety. Okay. <laughs> but um, there's a desire, at least on this project that I'm referring to, Cold Arm, this is a NASA project, um, to be able to not only survive these environments, but to operate the engineered systems in the environment without heaters, if you can get, can get uh, by without heaters. Because those, of course, consume power. Yeah. And power is, you know, essential as well. Uh, hot commodity. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, minus 180 degrees Celsius is not a bad number to keep in mind in terms of how bad it can get. Um, different temperatures of... in different areas and so on. But generally, that that's that, that starts to get to how bad it can get in many of those areas. I, I'm just trying to conceptualize the energy cost of what it would take to melt the ice now. Like, not even survive. Yeah being in the environment to work there. But mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe that's not how you, pro maybe you cut it out and then you process it in, in a warmer location. And so you're using the environment to your advantage. I, I wonder what, have you looked at like ice extraction techniques yet? Or is that? So I, I have not. That? Okay. Yeah, well, it's, it's some, there's many people thinking about it. This is the whole domain that I've referred to as in situ resource utilization. Um, so you have a body of scientists and engineers who are intently focused on this. And not just now, you know, some of these folks have been at this for decades. Wow. This is this has been a, a, a known nut to crack, you know, for a long time. Um, and so uh, you've got people who are experts in this field and can really break down to you um, what some of those processes are and how you might deal with them. Um, 
water ice material in one location versus another and things like that. Well, that's fascinating. So we haven't even encountered really like water ice, you know, extraterrestrially yet, but we've already got people that have devote, devoted like the majority of their careers to figuring it out. So once we do, we've got people that are ready to swoop in and, yeah. and you know, get in there and, and, you know, and do it. That's awesome. I mean, that's, yeah. that's really, really yeah. cool. And, and the technology, you know, development, in this domain at least, is typically driven by the scientific aspirations, right? And so just like we're talking about this, there have been people developing technology to do it, you know, based on whatever approaches that seem viable. Um, similarly for, for example, the some of the, uh, the moons of other planets that are, for example, Europa, uh, is uh, believed to have a largely ice covered outer surface and likely uh, some vast oceans underneath. Oh, that's and, interesting. And, and yeah, so, so knowing that for some amount of time already, there's already been people thinking about one, how to get through the ice to the, to the underlying uh, water. And if you can do that, how to move around in a, you know, a navigation sense. Yeah. How to communicate back. Harder, I would think. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And all these things, right? And so uh, when I was around, just to keep things in. Oh, I have a. Yeah. I'm sorry. You I, I, I can't stop my. I, I was just thinking, like, how would you communicate with a submarine underneath that layer of ice in Europa? And yeah. something that comes to mind is like the ultra low frequency uh, communications array we use to talk to our submarines. And so if you could establish something like that, like on the surface of the ice by staking it in yeah, and yeah. you could at least transmit, but then the receiving would still be difficult. Cause I don't know if you've got right. the area you would need to build that kind of a communications array on, on a submersible that would fit in a, in a rocket. So, right. Right. So, sorry, so, so the, the, the thought process you just went through is not unlike what these folks who focus on this have gone through and, either continue to deal with um, roadblocks or have found ways around some things. Um, what we almost always learn from what we've done on, in systems on Earth. Uh, in some cases, those solutions are not transferable for whatever complicated reason. Uh, in some cases, maybe, maybe so. So so that what you just described has certainly been thought of. It might even be part of whatever the first solutions we try are. Um, there's been things like um, the survivable equivalent of fiber optic, maybe. Um, even concepts of operation where if you can get beneath the surface of the ice and into some liquid medium, um, you do what you do exploration-wise and you come back to the hole, so to speak. Oh, and then you <laughs> dump all your data and then you go back down. Yeah, so, so there's all sorts of things, you know, there's a lot of people thinking about these things, but I bring it up because uh, to point out that, um, even field tests on Earth in many of these cases have been done in one way or another to try to do these things. So, you know, when I was at JPL, while those Mar early, earlier Mars missions were going on, there were other people involved with um, developing uh, subsurface probes that can navigate just like our underwater robots here. Um, but not only that, had some facility uh, to get through ice by drilling ever so slowly, things like that. You know, um, there's awesome. been numbers of concepts. Um, myself and a colleague um, back in, what when was this? Uh, oh boy, in the late 90s, I guess. We had um, co-edited a book. We called it uh, Intelligence for Space Robotics. And um, it was had a number of chapters written by people in the field. Cool. And at least one of them talks about this sort of, uh, you know, subsurface um, water, you know, uh, robot uh, that would first have to find a way through the uh, the ice uh, layer uh, and so on. So there's always concepts and it prototypes. Like a really fun thing to work on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, we had a number of researchers at JPL at the time that were involved in this, and they would go to locations in the Arctic and stuff like that, um, trying to, you know, to practice. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so these things are always going on, and so even with the the mining uh, aspects of things, you know, you've got people who have been looking at these things and doing field trials, 
you know, uh, taking large um, drills and trying to see how deep into the uh, the surface here on Earth they can actually drill. Um, trying to learn from Earth-based businesses, you know, construction and mining and so forth in terms of uh, how to do it uh, from a physics standpoint, um, but then needing to translate those solutions into systems that we could really realistically get to the destinations we're talking about. Yeah. You know, especially without their usual infrastructure, including people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. This is where yeah, robotics so. comes in. <laughs> this is where robotics comes in. This is where uh, the MacGyver types, types uh, show up again <laughs> in <Nice>. terms of, <laughs> you know, really novel and out of the box ideas and so on. That's awesome. I mean, I can see why you love this field. Like, it just yeah. seems like there's yeah. so many interesting environments and engineering challenges and just kind of things out there that, you know, you can't even conceptualize, you know, yeah. it, you know, if you, unless you've been exposed to it yet. And even then it seems like there's just layers of discovery that are kind of black swans and change, you know, what we think we know about, you know, some, yeah. you know, thing out in space, you know, that, that isn't here. And I guess that's true of certain things on earth too, but yeah, I can see why you love this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's never, um, we're never at a loss for a problem to solve. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> putting it lightly. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and if you really think about it, this is what engineers are driven by, right? Yeah, no, I know I am. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so you know, this is, uh, yeah, we, we, the folks who are engaged in this stuff, whether you're an engineer or um, a scientist of the many possible varieties. Um, that there are, um, these are the things that drive you. These are tough problems, you know, and, um, you know, I, I, I hesitate to compare science complexity with engineering complexity, you know, um, but just trying to, especially if you're trying to learn from what you know, based on what we know, how, how things work on earth. And when you're trying to do that, which is almost, you can almost never really avoid doing that, firstly. Um, but when you do that, you still have this, generally this mountain to climb between uh, translating that solution as you know it to one that really, again, can feasibly get to the destination you're interested in and work without the infrastructure. And I always like to emphasize that infrastructure includes the people. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. as you pointed out earlier, we can't, we generally don't have the luxury of somebody with a wrench or a screwdriver <laughs> <laughs> going over and, you know, making things right. So what are, what are some of the, um, the infrastructures you build in to, to supplant that? So you'd mentioned earlier, like over the air firmware updating, and it seems like to like a pretty deep extent, like you could pretty much rewrite the firmware to get around, you know, like I saw something in um, Goodnight Oppie where like a solar flare hit it and you guys were able to change some stuff around to, you know, not use, I guess, the bad sectors or memory yeah. or whatever to call it. I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. um, how what level of flexibility do you have with regard to the firmware? On the, are there any things that are just fixed and immutable and you can't? You can't rewrite them, or is everything pretty much up for you know over the air updates, and and it's a pretty yeah. flexible system. Yeah, some things are pretty rigid and you know sort of hard coded. Um, the degree to which things are flexible really varies mission to mission, but invariably, almost like a design principle, and maybe even something you'll find something on the system, in the system engineering handbook, <laughs> even <laughs> are are things like. Um, you know, uh, designing certain parts of the system to be uh, redundant. Yeah. Right. Especially avionics and computing systems and things like that. So instead, if you do run into those situations, you can either switch over to something or switch over to the equivalent of what is experienced an anomaly, at least long enough to fix the anomaly and switch back, you know. Oh, that's interesting. So you... You try to get off the anomalous system as what's running your mission, come over here, mm -hmm. run from there, even if it's not as computationally, you know, good, doesn't have the same capabilities. 
do the fix, upgrade the firmware over there, and then go back over here and continue to use that as yeah. your, your brain or whatever. Well, as one example, you know, and, and then even uh, there's um, when you try to deal with this sort of redundancy as kind of a baseline approach, um, it really then comes down to the nature of the problem that emerges too, right? Because it could be the case that just making the system redundant doesn't solve the problem that you experience. Ah, yeah. You know, that might not, not, might not even be the answer. Yeah, that's right? interesting. So I guess it depends on what you're up against. So can you give an example right. of that? Um, well, probably maybe one good example might, they might have covered this on Good Night Oppie. I'm not sure. It was a flight software issue. Um, and I remember this vividly because at least the occurrence of it, uh, because I had, let's see, shortly, so Spirit and Opportunity landed on Mars weeks apart from one another at different sides of the planet in January of 2004. Um, Spirit, when we got to the point after all the deployments and everything, so to a, a position in which it could actually drive, and Spirit was commanded to drive off the lander. Um, and we got to the point where all the people like me were very excited, the mobility people, because, you know, we were looking for that six wheels on soil moment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where we, we become relevant. You know? <laughs> and um, shortly after that, you know, we did one first drive, kind of a straight drive, uh, uh, a turn of the steering, you know, actuators, uh, a turn in place and a really short drive um, going up to a particular rock that was nearby and of interest to the scientists. But once we got to that rock, we started experiencing some software issues. The flight computer on the uh, on the rover kept rebooting ah. and couldn't figure out what the deal was. This was not specifically something that was designed for the, na the nature of the problem. Um, but there was kind of a, in the software uh, architecture and implementation, there was a, a back door, if you will, um, that a small subset of the flight software team actually even knew about and knew it could be used to sort of solve this problem. Nice. Now, I don't know enough to know whether or not they designed it as such for such a possibility. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Or if it was just kind of a thing that, you know, sort of a feature that wasn't quite labeled as a feature. <laughs> right. So a huge engineering. This, is, this may be depending on the answers to those curiosities that I don't know the answers to at this moment. Um, it was either brilliant <laughs> or, or just fortunate. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot. Um, but of I sense. bring it up as one of those examples because, um, again, it's really tough to uh, plan for everything, in particular in the design. So one of the best things you can do is not only um, design in a number of hooks for getting into and around within the system in various ways that are not nominal like a commands coming in and getting executed. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can, so you can do some measure of that uh, and hope that uh, if you run into a situation, it actually becomes useful. Yeah. Um, or you can attempt to, to, to forecast every potential issue and, you know, but, but what you find in, in those Not situations, if you really go try to go down that rabbit hole, is you ultimately end up with a system that's too expensive to, to meet the point. <laughs> well, I, so I would, something has to give. Yeah, that <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Well, I would imagine designing with that level of redundancy. I mean, if I'm remembering correctly, it's it's triple redundancy for like anything mission critical uh, on a NASA thing. If that's correct, I'm not sure. Often it depends yeah. um, if it's avionics, so like, electronics. If it's a human mission versus a, a robotic mission. Yeah, that makes sense. Like that. Yeah. So the, the way that it was explained to me years ago was that you've got like three different variables to track any kind of information. You've got three wires, uh, you know, as, as a path with separate 
cabling routes that, mm-hmm. that you know, mm-hmm. are used for any kind of communication channel that's critical. You maybe have three computers and then yeah. some kind of a voting system uh, for the outputs of those, presumably with a fourth computer. I don't know how that's done, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, or maybe yeah. an airlink. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, no, what you're describing are, are a number of the different architectures for um, being uh, fault redundant. Uh, and so on. And there's different gradations of them, um, different architectures, wires, and so forth uh, on how you can achieve that. Um, nowadays, there's even, um, to some degree, you know, dealing with like radiation uh, effects uh, where bits are being flipped by, you know, uh, encounters of radiation. Um, even some software-based approaches that you can actually, you know, that, that lend themselves oh, to... Oh, that's interesting. You're probably checking against parity and then moving bits back when you encounter yeah. an anomaly. Right, right. Yeah. That's, so that's anything and everything that, you know, uh, clever people can come up with <laughs> and that, that ultimately fits within the budget. <laughs> yeah, which is a big <laughs> the things that, that we try and continue to try. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I would imagine developing something, you know, triply redundant is probably more than three times as expensive as not like it's not like yeah. you're just building yeah. three of a thing i mean you you have to right. and and i guess goodnight oppie sort of pounded this point home a little bit when i was looking at some of the you know the pictures of it being built and you know they they showed the um the assembly bay and i mean it was it it looked a lot more complicated than i i had imagined just from seeing the pictures and and magazines growing up and Mm-hmm. You know, I, I always kind of thought of like that, you know, thing on the top as being like PVC pipe because I was a kid. I, you know, I didn't know any better. Okay, yeah, but then I looked right. at it and I'm like, that is a very tightly machined. You know? yeah. <laughs> we just yeah. painted it white so it loosely resembles it. But, you know, like right. the bolt circle looks like a difficult maintenance piece. But I guess, it, you know, you want to have that. And then, you know, the number of different cable channels and the amount of harnessing is almost yeah. a little bit organic because there's so much going on that it probably wasn't planned perfectly and people cut the lengths that's down right. as they that's did right. it bespoke. And so that's it's just interesting to, to see that with the perspective of a career and look back mm-hmm. on it. And also, I guess, just more shots. And yeah, I mean, that, and I, by the way, I do think the movie talked about the incident you were describing with the um, computer resetting. But yeah, I think the, it may have. Yeah. The level of personification they gave to that robot in the movie I guess mm-hmm. made it difficult for me to understand what was actually going on because I think they might have referred to it as like like some kind of like a schizophrenia or something or I oh, think okay. they, they tried to make it seem like a person and so as an engineer right. I'm just like what the hell are they talking about <laughs> you know? right no that makes sense yeah. I think to some degree I, so for the most part uh, that's not a perspective that's embedded in the engineers and scientists executing these missions, but sometimes it becomes um, useful as a way to relate, you know, the issues, if you will, um, to the public. That makes a lot Um, of sense. You know, without, um, you know, if you don't, especially if you're in a, you know, on a a news program or something like that, and you you only got some minutes to talk about whatever the issue is, and you don't want to go into you know, talking about uh, the rebooting and everything else and the triple redundancy. And, you yeah, know. you don't want to bore people to sleep or, or run over time. That's right. You kind of Give personify the entire course. Yeah. yeah, you know, and br- yeah. bring it to a behavioral yeah. level you know, yeah. that people can relate to and that sort of thing. And know. that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and yeah. I, I could see yeah. why they did it. And it actually was a really, really good movie. I quite, I quite enjoyed it. it. It was engaging the whole time which is mm-hmm. rare for a documentary. I feel like, uh, you know, it. there was no point at which I was, you know, thinking I, I, this is going to put me to sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the, yeah. the I, was, I was pretty riveted as well, especially yeah. for me, it was also quite nostalgic, as you might imagine. I was seeing, well, for a moment, not only myself looking much younger, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, colleagues, you know, and, and, and some of the footage that was included were things that I vividly remembered, you know, um, that wasn't shown on screen and so on. So it was very interesting. Uh, and then to see some of the, um, they had about maybe three, four, five 
uh, engineers and scientists uh, narrating throughout, as you might recall. Yeah, I do. Um, and these are, as, at least a subset of them are people that I worked with, you know, every day on these things. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was nice to see uh, them carry the uh, the story and um, bring up things that, you know, were I being interviewed as well for that, I might not have brought up. And so they <laughs> them bringing up certain stories and anecdotes, uh refreshed my own mind about some of those things um so i really did i really enjoyed it it was a really nicely done uh documentary film yeah it was fun i mean like the renderings were good too and then mm -hmm. the you know the emphasis on the uh like the wake up song was kind of playful and fun i thought right. that was, yeah yeah that was an yeah. interesting you know thing to have you know like waking up and yeah. right yeah like, absolutely I mean, so that's a good example of something that i had didn't think much about in retrospect. I hadn't, I had forgotten that that was going on. And then when to see it in the movie kind of reminded me, yeah, yeah, that was, you know, that was part of the, uh, the tradition, you know, that was what we were doing. And, you know, I remember any, any given moment when the wake up song might've been playing and I might've been on console, so to speak in mission operations. Um, I didn't pay much attention to the song, you know, I'm like, okay, we're <laughs> I'm, I'm getting ready for whatever what data are we expecting and so on and so forth. So it was kind of just a um, part of the routine. Yeah, that makes but a lot of sense. You, you knew you knew to expect it. Um, you might engage on particular songs, realizing how appropriate it is for the current <laughs> moment in the mission and things like that. You know, but uh, it was just sort of business as usual. Yeah, well, and I'm sure with other like songs, that. I mean, like you probably roll your eyes because it's just like, ah, cringe, you know, why would you right. yeah. play Journey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some of that. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you put it that way, I, I, I definitely can relate to that, right? Which is, you yeah. know, you're just focused on what you got to do because, I mean, your you're right. work. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So what else? I, I feel like we might we might be at a good stopping point, but I could also keep going. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Is, is there anything uh, that you know? I, I guess we didn't cover on last time that that you know you feel like people might find interesting. Mm -hmm. We could talk. I mean, last time we talked a little bit about satellite servicing type stuff we, we talked about some of that we did at the beginning so i think we started to yeah. talk about it i actually yeah. did think about that a little bit before i came in today as something uh -huh. that might be fun to understand the current state of the art on which i'm sure you know about oh, okay. uh -huh. and so uh -huh. i somebody recently relayed to me and I, I don't know how true this is or i don't think they're an expert on it either i think this was something they'd gotten through hearsay and like you know, this is a person that, you know, makes a product for the U.S. military. So they're and it's not the Space Force like this. This is something terrestrial. Okay. Yeah. And so they, they had just heard that, like, apparently some satellite servicing robot from some company. I, I don't remember which one went up and was able to, like, resuscitate somehow like a, a dead satellite and then also refuel another one, which I mean, First, I don't I don't know how true this is just because, you know, this is kind of the blind leading the blind. And mm. then is resuscitate like cleaning off a solar panel that's covered up or is it like, you know, actually changing out a part or what does that actually mean? Like, like just blowing yeah. off something or you spraying some solvent into a bad connect. I don't even know. And uh -huh. then, you know, was this the same mission or has this been multiple missions or is this just a loose right. proof of concept or is this something actually useful? I'm kind I got of curious you. where we're at. Yeah, so all, all of those examples are examples of um, what we would like to be able to do routinely. Um, there have been some uh, missions that have been flight experiments, again, proving out that you can actually do some of these things in, in the real environment, um, that have done things like uh, taken a two-part spacecraft up on orbit, one part has a robotic arm. The other part uh, is sort of the thing that will be operated on. So you kind of bring your problem with you, <laughs> separate, and then demonstrate the robotic capabilities to approach it, to grapple it, uh, to then uh, e 
either sort of birth it uh, to you, so, so it's one spacecraft again, such that oh, you can then use the robotic arm to do other, some of the other things you mentioned. Okay. So right? there's, so there's, there's, oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I was going to say, no birth it, there's no presumably some kind of a locking mechanism there that's, that's built into both. In some cases. Okay. In some cases. So invariably, most of these satellites that are already up there are not designed to be serviced. Makes sense. They don't have that. And so, yeah. Now, now the, the the future, uh, there there will be. This is the direction that that uh, things are starting to move in, designing features and stuff that vision systems can recognize, uh, other coupling uh, mechanisms for you know connecting these things together. Um. So before any of those things existed on the past technology demonstrations that have been done so far, um, either you flew a system up there that had some of these things, uh, April tags and fiducials and things like that, just to show that you, the technology is mature enough to do some of it. Um, but there's another, but there's a whole body of research associated with um, what do you do when you don't have things to help you? Um, and you want to grapple and service a so-called non-cooperative uh, client space, uh, satellite. Uh, meaning that there's, there's nothing there to help you grab it necessarily that was designed for that. <laughs> nothing to help you, your vision system that was designed to help vision systems and that sort of thing. And so a number of folks have gotten PhD dissertations and so forth, just looking at those problems. And some things have been tried on orbit um, by the U.S., by Japan and, and, and others. Um, where we are currently now, uh, we're coming up on the launch of a NASA mission called um, OSAM-1. OSAM-1. Uh, on-orbit, yeah, on-orbit servicing, assembly, and manufacturing one. Manufacturing? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So there, there's, that's what I mean. There's a suite of things that one can do. Um, and missions are becoming more and more real that actually do them. So this NASA one that's coming up is going to, actually uh, visit and uh, attach with Grapple a uh, the Landsat 7 satellite that's been out up there for a while and go through a number of different servicing activities. Is the Landsat um, 7 designed to be grappled with or is that? No. Okay, interesting. In most cases where you can you even think about doing that, um, most of them will have something we call a Marmon ring or it's actually a launch adapter, the thing that uh, connected it to the rocket. Oh, that's that's an interesting backdoor. Yeah, and that thing um, is a rigid, you know, as you might imagine, it's there to lock you together during launch. Yep. Um, it's a rigid structure, and often that becomes the place at which robotic grippers will want to grapple such a, a spacecraft. Yeah, it makes sense. That's indeed what they'll do with um, Landsat 7. Um, there's also, uh, let's see, not long ago, a um, year or so ago, Northrop Grumman uh, and others, or their partners, they actually um, extended the lifetime, operational lifetime of some of the satellites that are up there okay. by applying what they call a mission extension vehicle uh, to it that has capabilities built in that if, as long as you can attach it to, these, the satellite that's up there, the satellite can then use them. So um, like additional power, um, just newer newer suites of sensors. Um, the good all good examples of uh, things that might uh, extend the mission. Um, there's also been uh, there some some satellites right. have things called an orbital replacement unit, an actual unit that can be removed and replaced by another one. Oh, and, interesting. Uh, yeah, and typically those types of things might be things that um, you see astronauts do more routinely on like the International Space Station, doing spacewalks and stuff like that. Um, but there's always been a push to enable robotic satellites um, to uh, be able to do those things. And there have been demonstrations of some subsets of those things as well, including um, NASA uh, had a experiment they called robotic refueling mission, but they had the, all the apparatus on the outside of the International Space Station and uh, had a robotic system showing how you can do some of these things, including the transfer of fluid uh, representing fuel. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, so so a lot of these things are being developed. Um, the OSAM-1 mission will demonstrate a number of these things on Landsat 7. Uh, then there's the Northrop Grumman mission, the mission extension vehicle. Uh, so there's a number of pieces there. Um, so the, the, the state of the art, if you will, the state of the practice, I should say, yeah, uh, is such that a lot of these capabilities, some of which have been shown on orbit, um, exist and are being matured. They're not at the point where um, any given company can routinely pump these systems out and routinely do these jobs. That makes um, a lot but of things sense. are moving and moving in that direction. Uh, motive is involved in some of that stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, for OSAM one, the one I just was describing, um, Motive has uh, delivered uh, motor control uh, hardware for some of those uh, the systems on that. There's awesome. another mission coming up later called um, OSAM two, which is actually focused on the manufacturing aspect. Um, Motive is a part of that mission too. So They're curious how that's going to work. Well, what they're doing in that one in particular is 3D printing. Okay, that's easier than machining. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so, so this would be kind of the early version of, of you know any real capability on orbit showing how we can do these things. The nature of that one is such that uh, you've got a satellite that goes up. Um, it has a, a motor robotic arm on it, nice. <laughs> and um, they have a 3D printing uh, apparatus as part of this, and they need the robotic arm to initially configure that 3D printing machine, uh, what it's going to do after it's configured is a rolled up solar array will start to unfurl while a 3D printed beam is being printed. Oh, nice. That, 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 yeah, the solar array, one, it will be attached to, one end of it will be attached to the end of the 3D printed beam. And as it's being printed and therefore growing longer and longer and longer. Yep. It's just unfurling the solar array. Nice. And then uh, the, and once that one is uh, done, uh, another one on the other side of the spacecraft of the satellite is what will be done. So the robotic arm is needed to move some parts of the 3D printing apparatus to the other side and do the same thing out there. That's so now really the, the huge advantage, at least from a mission kind of standpoint, is that the uh, these larger solar arrays will generate more power you know 10 times or whatever the real number is than you might otherwise have with the solar arrays you would have been able to launch with yeah that's as that's opposed awesome. to manu manufactured in space and you um, only have so much 3d printer filament assuming it's an fdm yeah. printer i don't know what they're using but so i mean it's not you're going to be manufacturing all sorts of bits for everything up there but if you That's can at right. least make your own scaffolding for your, you know, and it's probably a calculated amount of, of 3D printer medium because of the weight limitations to and the space. So yeah. that's, that's yeah. so you, you've got a very specific printing mission and that's to, to deploy that solar array. That's cool. That's right. And that will be sort of the beginning of, um, hey, here's what we can do. Can you now imagine what else we can do? You know, <laughs> and, and there'll, there'll be, this will what will follow will be more well, you could send a mission extension you know refill to something like yeah, that. yeah that's that right stuff. that's right i mean I, the way i kind of view it sometimes when i think about it is um so it was on orbit servicing assembling and manufacturing so you've got the uh the o and the s on orbit servicing servicing has been where most of the attention have, has been paid over the, the decades if you will to the point where some real systems have been recently demonstrated um that were not exactly technology experiments but beyond a step beyond um and then you've got uh, assembly and you've got manufacturing uh we're starting to move into the uh, the manufacturing part with this uh, 3d printed thing and other things will come along the assembly will be what will be a real big deal um later um, because there's a lot there's always been um a lot of interest in being able to assemble structures in space it sounds like your arm is already doing some of that, though, uh, at least with that manufacturing focused mission. Yeah, it's doing a small part of the of the, the logistics of that operation. I mean, if you're moving but, a thing from here to here, that's assembly, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not denying it. <laughs> <laughs> but but, you know, when you think about, um, again, some of the ambitions of future missions, we're yeah, talking 
manipulating structures and connecting them. Yeah. And some of them can be quite large. And, you know, there's <laughs> a lot of different concepts uh, that have been over the years as well, um, including things like what uh, Motive is also working on, along with others, robotic limbs, if you will, that um, attach by the base to some portion of the structure, do some work, and then attach the, uh, the terminal end to another part, release the base, and the terminal end becomes the base. Oh, that's cool. And, you know, so, so we're being able to sort of walk along and across and over and around a structure while you're doing tasks associated with um, the overall construction effort. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of assembly capability that's going on. Some of it right now is being matured in university labs and uh, national labs and so on um, around the world. Um, but this is where all this is headed. I you saw know, something like do... that in the Field Robotics Center at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. I don't know what it was, but it was hanging from the ceiling for a while, and there were these joiner mm -hmm. pieces and struts between them, and there was a robot yeah. that, you know, inchwormed along it and, and presumably put bits together. Indeed. Yeah. So 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 Carnegie Mellon and NREC have been engaged in this domain for a long time, actually. Okay. Yeah. So that's um, no that's yeah. no coincidence. That's right. No <laughs> I didn't coincidence. Imagine it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. The Field Robotics Institute has been involved in a lot of the uh, on-orbit servicing type capability development. And as you know, certainly a lot of the surface rover stuff. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, yeah, lot, lots of capability there. Yeah, no, it's it's neat to see what people are up to. And it's it's fun to hear about some of these projects. I did have a question when you were mentioning the uh, the mission extension. Uh, you called it a mission extension vehicle. Yeah, that's what North of Berlin called their, uh, their device. Yeah. So, if you have the capability to launch something like that, which is like presumably not nothing, like why not just launch another satellite? I guess like to to just be devil's advocate here. That's a good question, and I think that you know probably an easy answer is. Um, a uh, whole satellite generally just has a whole lot more capability and would be a lot more expensive. Um, you've already got in these mission extension types of uh, approaches, um, a structure up there. It has its own navigation capability. It can move and you know do its thing. You don't have to duplicate that. Yep. Um, effectively bringing something to add to this asset that you already have. Yeah. Um, if you were to try to just build a new asset, um, yeah, the, the easiest answer is that it would be much more expensive. That makes sense. Um, presumably you could carry the launch, the launch of the of, of the asset as well. Yeah. You know. Well, that's yeah. kind of what I was thinking. Is like launches don't seem to be cheap right now. I mean, they're cheaper than they've ever been, though. I guess like. I, against that point yeah yeah so, ever, ever, so, ever so gradually you know costs come down for the, some of these things yeah it's been really cool to see that um i guess if you could carry a few of them in one launch too i mean that would be mm -hmm. that would be pretty great right so if you had like yeah. four mission extension vehicles and you could service four satellites and amortize the launch cost across those this is where some of this is headed okay fact. you know the um I mentioned the OSAM-1 mission. That, in some ways, will be kind of a uh, a proof of a concept, if you will, um, for future systems that will have this as a job to go up with uh, multiple replacement units or extension vehicle uh, devices and uh, apply those to multiple satellites. That's pretty cool. Yeah, including fuel. There's a, there's at least one company um, called OrbitFab, for example, that um, is focused on the refueling problem for satellites. Nice. And intends to enable, uh, in effect, um, depots or, or gas stations that are just out there. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really cool. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What kind of fuel do these satellites run on typically? Um, or I guess um, more different, type, different types of propellant, different types of propellant um, for different spacecraft. And, and, and indeed, they have different propulsion systems, some of them. Um, so it depends. Uh, but monopropellant, um, hydrazine, a lot of different types. Okay. Um, yeah, I couldn't even rattle them all off. Uh, 
But there's different types of um, engines and thrusters and everything else that go on different varieties of spacecraft, and they're all fueled in different ways. So a service station would be logistically challenging because you'd have to stock a lot of different types. Or maybe you just specialize in one propellant. And maybe you do. Yeah, maybe you do. Satellites. Maybe maybe you have maybe you have a depot of one type and a depot of another type or something like that. Yeah, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. And yeah. then that be, if that exists, then that becomes a future satellite design constraint, you know, which is like we know we can get a hold of this in orbit, so may as well right. use use that. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Creates another uh, constraint in your multi-objective optimization problem. <laughs> <laughs> One more inequality. <laughs> uh, it's always fun when the target keeps moving. <laughs> <It's> not... <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is this is where that whole you know domain you know this, people are referred to on uh, to OSAM, but of late there's been kind of a nomenclature alternative uh, ISAM. Um, so on orbit versus in space. Oh, interesting. Is the difference just in space is like beyond orbit? Um, so it can be in space includes the planetary surfaces and things like that. Whereas on orbit is largely Earth orbit kind of a but in focus. space could be like on the surface of the moon that would be considered in space. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. But the same things last three letters is, is something that is still a, a, an aspiration. Servicing, Service assembly, assembly, manufacturing. manufacturing. You know whether on orbit or at multiple to different um, destinations in in the solar system. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And I mean. Yeah, I guess if we want this to be, you know, expandable or if we want to continue to, you know, be able to send stuff out, we have to be able to fix it. And, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of, you know, you, you send it and you're done now. And I mean, if you could if you could crack that, you know, I guess a lot more becomes possible. I mean, with the assembly and manufacturing side, I mean, I guess the, the obvious thing where, where my imagination goes is just larger spacecraft. Um, mm -hmm. than, than what you could fit in a rocket. And I guess we sort of already have that with the space station because it's just a bunch of those, you know, bolted together. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, we've got people it's there with station. a wrench. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So space <laughs> station is uh, kind of the prime example uh, that we currently have. Then there's, um, there's structures. Like, for example, the most recent um, Lars telescope the uh, James Webb Telescope, which has been in the news quite a bit these days. Yeah. Um, there's actually a desire to be able to, to build such things, in part at least, in space, to avoid having to launch that whole honking thing. Uh, What's the scale of it? Just because I've, I've seen some of the pictures and they're beautiful, but mm -hmm. I, I guess I've never actually seen a picture of the James Webb Space Telescope itself or, mm -hmm. you know, really... Like, what is, how big is that thing? Yeah, so I, I don't know the actual dimensions. I never committed it to memory, oh, but no some of the pictures I've seen, uh, I mean, let me try to give an example of um, if you were inside some sort of facility. Uh, so imagine being on a, a basketball court, maybe okay. like in a high school. Um, a significant portion of the court would be covered by the James Webb Telescope. <laughs> and okay. um, That's in terms large. of height, it would, it would get up there well beyond the uh, the backboards and everything else. And, and okay, uh, that's, the, that uh, is a honking thing. The, uh, the, the scoring, you know, cube <laughs> that might be up in the, in the center of there. So it's huge. That's in massive. That regard. Um, s s pictures that I've seen of people operating on working on it when it was being built, you know, the, the people are quite small in those pictures. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's kind of how I was able to get the scale of the Opportunity rover, was just seeing the good night oppie scenes with people yeah. building it. You know, that, yeah. right. that that I was like, oh, I didn't realize it was it was that size. So, right. that's and so, 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 so telescopes like that and others, um, you know, I was involved in some studies when I was back at JPL years ago, uh, looking at um, architectures for large space telescopes. Um, generally, the idea there was you always were interested in incre increasing the aperture of the uh, such a telescope, ah. including the size of the mirror and everything else. But you never really wanted to launch such, such a system. So there was a lot of attention paid to how do you get some pieces up there such that you can assemble. That's interesting. You know? 
Yeah, and so this is another area where the robotic assembly is sort of um, motivated for, um, not just um, things like the space station, but structures that carry or that are parts of much larger uh, space systems that might be out there, such as large telescopes yeah. and other things. Yeah. Because you could presumably build something much bigger. I mean, it, it seems like the diameter of the aperture is still a limiting factor because you've got to somehow get that inside a rocket fuselage. and just That's right. Space and, but this is also deal. where, yeah, no, that's right. But, but this is also where uh, the segmented mirror architecture comes into play. Oh, interesting. I, I, is that what it sounds like, where you've just got a bunch of bits that make up your mirror? Effectively. Cool. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, almost like a fly's eye, you know, just made of a bunch of small mirrors that you can uh, aspirationally assemble in space. Nice. Um, you know, we have a concept we've been, you know, working on as well along those lines uh, at, at Motive. Um, you know, how can you, uh, on a smaller scale, not, not a huge, you know, uh, you know, 10 meter aperture type thing <laughs> you know, something on a smaller scale but where the um the mirror uh segments are such that um they're small enough to be manipulated and placed uh in a sort of assembly fashion but as a composite uh it you know ends up being a um a larger mirror for a telescope yeah that that's fascinating I, okay that so that solves that problem yeah that, that would that would be uh pretty awesome what we could achieve with you know that sort of creativity yeah yeah so it's a whole a whole big field of applications in this um isam and osam you know uh paradigm if you will and i think we're, we're at the very early stages of it um as i mentioned there's been some things that have been demonstrated uh the osam one mission is going to go a long way towards a lot of things that folks have been talking about for a long time um, and those things have been designed into the system. As I recall, the last uh, topology or architecture that I've seen for OSAM-1 um, would have uh, three robotic arms. And, <laughs> you know, so it would be quite an interesting uh, device from a robotic standpoint. Oh, that's um, interesting. That, that yeah. sounds, because um, OSAM-1 is focusing on the servicing, so... It's got, three, yeah. if I'm remembering correctly, and then three robotic arms. What, you, you said the mission, but I, I'm, I apologize. I'm just, uh, mm -hmm. oh, no, I remember now. So it's, it's grabbing that older satellite by the bit that it used to mate to the rocket originally and yeah. then doing That's some right. work on it. Okay. Yeah. And so, so even, even OSAM, OSAM well, 1 is doing three that. robotic He's... arms for that. That seems like overkill. Well, you, you don't, um, but one of those arms can do that part. Uh, the grapple. And you don't have to, you, you, it ends up, um, in effect, rigidizing the two satellites as one system. Oh. So if you can imagine holding it with one yep. and then the other arm's doing work. And then the one that's holding it, now you can reposition the base for the other ones. So you can presumably get it to a location that makes more sense to work from. Well, in this, this case, you won't be moving the bases of them. They'll just be, uh, in fact, I believe they're all um, situated on what we can effectively call the top of the spacecraft, the far part that will be facing the other uh, satellite that will be being serviced. Um, and the one arm is actually holding the other spacecraft and bringing it close. Yep. And the other arms, which are effectively have the same plane on which the base of those other arms exist as, the, as the, the arm that's holding it. And they're free then to do things, inspect things around the spacecraft, um, do any sort of replacement or whatever they, that they're, they're trying to do. You've got two arms uh, with uh, interchangeable end effectors, you know, different so tools. So if one breaks, you're not use. totally screwed. <laughs> right, you're not totally screwed. And, um, and you know, there might be a degree of uh, you utilizing one even to um effectively use its camera as another perspective on the operation oh, of the food. That's that's, awesome. you know all sorts of stuff yeah yeah just uh, a number of different um reasons why uh such a three arm system could be quite effective that that makes a lot of sense i feel like i go both ways on dual manipulator systems because on the one hand it's you know at least twice as expensive as a single manipulator system 
Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, what you just described are some really interesting use cases. So yeah. the camera yeah. one, for instance, in a place where you can't have a person holding a camera actually mm -hmm. seems quite useful. Um, yeah. Human teleoperation with the dual arms, I guess, is something else that is, is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm sure there's more that I just that wouldn't occur to me that I, I can't think of, but where you would need dual manipulation as opposed to maybe holding something against something else um, if you're trying right. to manipulate fasteners and things like that. Yeah, it, it can be a tough sell for, you know, why you really need it in certain, certain applications. But at least in the case, like, for example, a motive is working on, a, um, we have a particular configuration that uses our X-Link robotic arms um, as a dual manipulator system. Uh, and in particular, for one of the, the near-term sort of use cases, one arm really does the same job as what I mentioned for the OSAM-1 mission, which is uh, effectively grapple the other yep. satellite. And that's all it does is it keeps a hold of it. While the other one um, does other things. In this case, uh, it's sort of like the mission extension vehicle uh, operation, concept of operations in that on the spacecraft will be certain modules that have certain capability and you can grab it off of yourself with the free arm and place it onto the satellite. Very cool. Yeah, and basically uh, enable it to be operational and add whatever capability is adding. Um, and so that's, again, one other instance where that one arm is really just bracing the whole, you know, uh, dual uh, satellite um, structure. Yeah. Uh, well, we one is free to do uh, actual. Well, and in that dual arm case that you're describing, it sounds like it's absolutely essential to have two arms because if you need one yeah. to grapple, I mean, there's no getting around that. That's you right. Know. That's right. Unless you're doing some sort of um, standoff inspection at close proximity or something like that with cameras on an arm and things like that, um, you can do that with one arm. But the rigidity, you know? I would think, would be your friend in a situation like that because. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you just have one little glitch in controls and all of a sudden you've bungled the whole operation. Yeah, there's a ton, there's a ton that can go wrong. And especially if you're dealing with a, um, a non-cooperative target, like I mentioned before. <laughs> uh, and then in this case, uh, sort of there's a couple of flavors of that. One in which um, you might be trying to do something with a, a dead satellite, right? It has no controls. It's just out there drifting. Yeah. Um, or you might be trying to do something that does have um, controls and is an actual active asset, um, in which case, depending on what you're trying to do, you'll probably want its control system to be turned off. Yeah, that makes sense. So you don't want it fighting against you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, imagine it'd be very difficult to synchronize those or get them to work yeah. nicely together where they're not. Yeah, like you it said. It can be done, it can be done, but yeah, it's uh, it kind of depends on, um, because ultimately as this technology matures, you're going to get in situations where things are a bit more like they are like at the, the International Space Station where uh, other vehicles visit, they approach, they stand off and hold and, and wait for your arm to come out and grab them and pull them, you know, to the structure, you know, and in those instances, um, there is some level of cooperation between the systems, you know, some protocol, some handshaking and things like that. That makes a lot. But then presumably when the arm grabs it, then it turns off its, its you know, flight controls or whatever. Ideally. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in most cases, because, yeah, like I said, he, the attitude control system on that thing is principally trying to maintain, you know, its own attitude or whatever uh, it's trying to do. And that's um, certainly sending, you know, commands to motors. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, makes a lot of sense. All right. Well, I, I think we covered some good ground here. Um, I feel like this is a great place to end this one. Um, would love to do okay. this again, though. Uh, is there anything you want yeah, to like? No, it's good. Yeah, I, I, I had an awesome time, and I, I feel like I learned a lot here, too. I, I always do when I talk to you. <laughs> oh, well, good, good. I'm glad. So um, is there anything you want to plug on the way out? Uh, any any projects, motives doing that you um, want to kind of leave people with? or? See, I mentioned a number of them. Uh, you know, one that I didn't mention um, that we're working on with JPL is, uh, you know, we're we're developing a set of uh, small rovers for the moon. Oh, um, this is yeah, this is a, a technology experiment. Okay. 
Yeah, where we're, the whole objective of this one is um, demonstrating cooperative autonomy on the surface of the moon. And so um, there'll be several rovers that will be landed together and um, they'll all have some instrumentation on them to be able to, uh, in this case, we're talking ground penetrating radar. Um, they will be landed at a location on the moon that has some interesting magnetic anomalies that we don't understand as a scientific community. And um, so they would be taking local measurements of that underground uh, uh, magnetic um, anomaly, but at different locations where the rovers are. And they'll yeah. be taking those measurements in tandem and at the same time, such that you've got a distributed measurement. Oh, that's um, interesting. So you take the measurements from the rovers, you aggregate them, and, and that becomes your, your map of that area, basically? Basically, yeah, yeah. And they'll be doing that... Um, in order to do that, they'll need to be able to do things like some formation driving and things like that. And, you know, to some degree, um, cooperating as a unit. Uh, do as you a need single a swarm to accomplish that mission? Or is it more just because of like proving out the swarm concept for the next mission? It's more of the, it's really technology focused. So it's really yeah. uh, proving out the, the, the swarm autonomy aspects of it. Um, you can imagine something similar being useful for a system with totally different instrumentation, for yep. example. Yeah, for sure. Um, but no, this one is uh, is focused on that that particular objective. And so, yeah, Motive is uh, working with JPL. JPL is doing this mission. Um, we're involved with uh, helping to design the chassis of the rover, some of its mobilities, uh, portions, um, okay. providing motor controllers for the system. Nice including motor controllers that would enable them to deploy from the lander and so on. Uh, so yeah, we're, that, that's one of the other things that I hadn't mentioned. Um, those are all in the same class of missions of uh, under the umbrella of NASA's um, uh, lunar program. Um, and there's a number of different missions that people are going to be hearing about because some of them are upcoming. In fact, Viper, the Viper rover that I mentioned is one yeah. of those, the nice. earlier one. Um, so yeah, so we're doing that, and uh, that's the, the one with the the crater. Just, wow, that's... Yeah, 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 the permanently shadowed um, regions and the ice prospecting and all that. That's fast. Um, that's going to be really cool if if you guys can actually find uh, ice there. Yeah, figure well, out that, we, we, we kind of are pretty convinced. We being the scientific community, um, that there is stuff there. It's just you know, how do you access it? <laughs> yeah. Easier, easier yeah. said than done. <laughs> it yes, like... Indeed, indeed. <laughs> with the with the GPR fleet, is that how many robots yeah. are in the swarm? Uh, you might have. Said, um, it's just, it's just three. They're just okay. three. So it's again just you know the the core of the concept. You know, two wouldn't quite cut it. You know, yeah. in terms of the concept and yeah. So it's going to be just just, just several. Cool. Well, three. and I would think if you can get something like that working, I mean. It seems like patience is, is a huge virtue on these unmanned space missions, but I mean, you know, it would get your time down to scan an area to have multiple yeah. assets working in tandem as opposed to just one. So this is true. This yeah. is true. And there's always been sort of a, you know, the robotics community has always said, well, why isn't uh, NASA and other space agencies doing multi robot missions? And so yeah, there's a lot of different reasons, and we can have another, you know, uh, <laughs> podcast on yeah, that. Yeah, I'm into that. But, uh, yeah. But um, the it's now come to a level of importance and uh, appreciation of its advantages um, to where you know we're getting closer to that to that sort of thing. The the one mission I mentioned, um, or at least concept I mentioned a while back, a while ago on, on this this uh, call is um, the nano rover technology mission uh, technology that that I mentioned. This was nano rover by virtue of its name was really small. Rover. Yeah, um, it could almost fit. It could cover your hand. Well, basically, it's really small. Uh, and the idea with those was along the same line of thinking, kind of a swarm type concept. Um, and uh, but in particular, as they were so small, the idea was that on any given mission that's going to a you know conducive uh, destination, um, the spare room in the fairing <laughs> could be uh could accommodate small rovers like these you yeah know, it's one mission it might be three another mission it might be 12. 
That's <laughs> and the idea, at least part of the idea, was to be able to take advantage of that and um, to fly these things to certain destinations. Especially if it's just dead space right now. I mean, exactly. That that was yeah. the the idea. I, I'm picturing <laughs> nano rovers from a lot of different startups, as opposed to like one type yeah. of nano rover <laughs> that they just fill Absolutely. with packing peanuts. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that was at least the core of the uh part of the motivation you know um but it was a really interesting it was a technology you know sort of thing we were developing you know the capability the challenge there of course other than just taking advantage of free space was um you know uh exercise and how small can you make these systems yeah i would think mobility would be challenging viable, yeah, mobility yeah the necessary um, computing inside a Makes small a device sense. and all of that was part of it. Um, powering them if they're not, if they're solar powered to any degree, oh, you know, or you're limited to a very small solar, you know, footprint, solar panel foot, footprint. Yep. A lot of those were the, were the things that we were investigating there. And some of the things that we had come up with at the time included things like making the circuit boards part of the actual structure of the chassis. <laughs> it was a major sort of optimization thing how small can we make these things i mean if that works like if you control. have the rigidity you need there i mean kudos like that's awesome yeah yeah in that case you know we we're talking you're really small um i think we were like they were supposed to be like one kilogram you know mass for the whole rover that's not very big it's not it's I've, not i've got a five kilogram robot in this office that i think is small <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. So yeah, right, so again, another sort of um, pushing the envelope type thing that you know was done quite a while back in the past. But uh, you know, in the space robotics domain, these things always come back. Uh, many things never get realized on rover missions, and so do the you, ideas stay around. Do you suffer? I would think in the nano rover, at least, like terra mechanics comes to mind as, as your enemy i mean like if you have tiny wheels i would think it would be hard to get purchase and yeah certain soil types um like that that's what i meant when i brought up mobility i guess okay um, yeah how are you getting around that like how is it just the same thing but at a smaller scale because like, the weight's so low you don't really need as large yeah. wheels yeah some of that some of it is simple scaling like that but then other things like for example the um, this this rover prototype had aluminum wheels, and machined into the wheel tread, if you will, were uh, what we called helical grousers, right? Grousers, so you affect, you, I, if I remember correctly, are those fins around the outside? Yeah. So helical uh, well, grousers on, on on the actual tread. Wait, but when you say tread, you mean the, the outer outside of the aluminum cylinder, right? So the whole thing is one piece of aluminum in this case. Interesting. <laughs> I'm picturing like helical <laughs> gears, like little, like 45 degree slats going. Yes, 45 degree, um, all around the whole rim that was effectively the tire. Interesting. Right, and angled in such a way that it almost gets when you, you drive in loose soil, you're getting effectively the Archimedes screw effect on this. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say, so, you could go sideways. Yeah, so, so you're, you're, gaining, you're gaining some purchase in that regard. And yeah. then um, I believe, let's see, on one one side versus the other, the helix, the helix was angled in the opposite way so that yeah. you could turn in place with good purchase as well. Nice. Yeah, so That's you're turning, clever. you know. Yeah, so different, again. Are, you, are they using these help. to... to strafe or is that not even a use case um in this case no it wasn't quite designed to be able to do that but you can okay. imagine how you could that's what uh, i was thinking like with an exaggerated yeah. version you mentioned the archimedes screw i was right yeah. right there have been uh, earth vehicles like that you're probably familiar with yeah um, for sure <laughs> yeah yeah so getting around in the mud and stuff like that and strafing side to side and all sorts of stuff yeah i'm thinking of um, that russian one where it looks like oil drums you know welded together that's exactly those. the one i'm thinking yep. about <laughs> so, so yeah cool you see yeah indeed indeed they have some uh interesting uh rf toys out like for, for the, with that uh, design now. nice <laughs> they've had them out for a while uh, actually some of them they actually use it on in pools and so they can you know navigate traverse on, on top of the water so that's awesome 
That sounds like a lot of fun. I was at my friend Nicole's place, uh, who's also been on this podcast, uh, about a month ago, and her kid had an RC car with uh, mechanum wheels on it. So I thought that was really cool that those made it into the toy space. Right. That's nice. That's nice. So, yeah. So ideas abound. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know... um, Sometimes there is no idea, and but there's an ambition to do something pretty spectacular, and so you got to come up with them, you know. That's wild. Well, if you ever want to get a brainstorming session going, I feel like uh, it would just be fun. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 they always call are. Call me anytime. <laughs> okay, all right. I might hold you to that. <laughs> I, I, I will take you up on it. I mean it. <laughs> all right. All right, well, I'm going to cut awesome. it. It's been fun, and uh, I'm looking Same. forward to having you on the next one. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.